afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Al Borgartz. I'm the Deputy Provost here at uh, Army University. So I'd like to welcome you to this uh, Corelmo session. Uh, so happy end of fiscal year to everybody. Um, looks like we will have a budget uh, for the DOD at least. Uh, so we'll, for the use of civilians that we're planning a, a half day or better off on Monday, it's looking pretty grim right now. Uh, so you may have to plan to work all day. So on behalf of General Lundy, I'd like to, one, uh, welcome our panel members uh, and thank you for your participation in today's panel. And then, two, welcome all of you. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and uh, we certainly appreciate your engagement as we talk about uh, some pretty serious business. Unfortunately, General Lundy was supposed to open the session today, but uh, he's uh, been called off on a higher level mission. I'm sure everybody can appreciate uh, when that happens. So we're sad that he's not here, uh, but uh, certainly uh, he's here in spirit. If he were here, I'm sure that uh, one of the things that he would talk about, because he's consistent in his messaging, is kind of the unique position we're at uh, in the world today. Uh, we have defense strategy that calls out four adversaries by name, something that we haven't recently uh, seen. So uh, the topics that we're going to talk about today are very, very uh, in touch and in tune with that. As we kind of refocus our Army, our joint services, and then also working with our multinational partners to large-scale ground combat operation, it's important that we kind of know uh, our potential adversaries, uh, know the operation, operating environment that we could face uh, in the near future or in the far future. Uh, so panels like this are very important to one, understanding the culture and then some of the second, third order things that impact uh, the environment that we may find ourselves in in the near future. So uh, Dr. I'd like to thank you for putting this on and uh, for moderating for us today. So I'd like to uh, take just a few minutes to introduce the panel members as you face the screen moving from the left to right. First is uh, Mr. Mark Wilcox. He's with the uh, DeJamo, Department of Joint Interagency and Multinational Operation, and he's going to be here talking about Russia. And then next to him is Dr. Nicholas Everstadt of the American Enterprise Institute, and he'll also be talking about Russian demographics. And then third is uh, Dr. or excuse me, Mr. Jeffrey uh, Votermark. He's with the JMO also, and he'll be uh, focusing on Turkey. And then lastly, uh, Mr. Steve Hecker. He's a senior representative from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, or DNI, and he'll be addressing Iran. Uh, and then uh, certainly uh, we hope to have uh, engagement from the audience, so your participation is encouraged. And then uh, our moderator will be uh, Dr. I. He asked me specifically because he knew I would mess up his last name not to pronounce it. So uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. I. And again, thank you for your participation today. Uh, thank you, sir. We greatly appreciate your support. Thank you all for joining us today for Krelmo's next quarterly session and discussion of this very timely and important topic. Anybody has any doubt that is important? No doubt? Okay. So my name is, I'm going to try to pronounce my name, Mahir Ibrahimov. I think it, I got this right. I am the director of the Army's Culture, Regional Expertise and Language Management Office, Krelmo, and I will serve as the moderator of today's session. Next slide, please. The topic of our panel today is Strategic Culture of Eurasia, Challenges for U.S. National Security. This topic, similar to our previous panels, remains one of our top national security challenges. It's very obvious, right? So why does the term strategic culture? I'm trying to set the stage for the terms we're going to use as a moderator. So why this term we use in the topic of our panel today? Every time we conduct our panels, we emphasize the importance of sociocultural, historical, and foreign language considerations for our military missions. There are many definitions of culture in the Army as well as academia, which reflects its diversity. Soviet culture, Western culture, Iraqi culture, Afghan culture, military culture, corporate culture, generational culture. Becoming aware of cultural dynamics is a difficult task because culture is based on experiences, values, behaviors, beliefs, and norms, as well as collective memories and history. Then we talk about the strategic culture, which can be traced back to the 1970s, when the scholars examined Soviet deterrence policy 
and concluded that U.S. analysts failed to predict Soviet policies. According to those scholars, the major reason for miscalculations was that the expectations would be the same as the Westerners and Americans would react in certain situations. However, that policy approach proved to be fundamentally wrong because each country has its unique sociocultural and historical considerations, which shape that country's views, interpretations, including towards the matters of international relations and foreign policy. That makes sense? Our panel today will discuss the differences in the strategic cultures of the given countries, Iran, Turkey, Russia, right? Which might shape their thinking and behavior among themselves, as well as on the international arena. Given the limited time, we'll try to approach the discussion from their perspective to understand their behavior, okay? There are four panel members today, including two nationally known experts and two distinguished scholars from CJSC. The intellectual potential right here. You can feel that, right? Mr. Stephen Hecker from the Office of the Director for National Intelligence to address Iran. Mr. Jeffrey Vordermark of the Command and General Staff College to discuss Turkey. Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt of the American Enterprise Institute, as you know, it's a think tank in DC, who would tackle the Russian demographics. Mr. Mark Wilcox, CGSC, to cover the rest of Russia aspects and its possible implications for the US national security. If everybody following us, speech, uh, pace, everything is good, okay. The complete bios of the panel members can be accessed at Kremlin website, and we'll follow that later. The panel is conducted from 1 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. The event is unclassified. The entire session is being video recorded, and along with related materials, will be posted on Kremlin's website within about one week for further educational purposes, for your mission purposes, okay? The target audience is, please pay attention, Army schools, centers of excellence, regional line forces, security force assistance brigades, and other deployed and deploying units, universities, think tanks, joint interagency and multinational partners. This is how you can access the video and related information as well as other Krelmo capabilities. Next slide, please. This public domain Krelmo page can be accessed simply by typing Krelmo on your browser from anywhere, your home computer, okay? All these organizations are Krelmo's active partners, okay? If you click on only any of these icons, you can access their respective websites. If you click on Krelmo logo in the middle of the page, it will get you to its homepage. Next slide, please. Click on the second link, arrow shows right here. Next slide, please. So you can watch today's session on the conferences, seminars, and forums right here along with other previous events. We had videos of all previous events, which we do every two, three months with related information, okay? The opinion and discussion points during the session are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent official positions of the United States government. The initial remarks by the speakers for about 10, 12 minutes will be followed by questions, answers, comment session from the audience for the rest of the time, including from outstations, links through VTC across the Army and beyond. Next slide, please. Without further ado, I would like to yield the floor to Mr. Stephen Hecker, who will address strategic culture of Iran. Mr. Hecker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. I. It's okay if I uh, remain seated here? Absolutely. Excellent. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Pleasure to be here. 
Dr. Ah, I appreciate the opportunity to get out of Washington, D.C. For, uh, for a day. Uh, and as a proud uh, command and staff college grad of the U.S. Navy up in Newport a million years ago, uh, I, I love this environment. Uh, and I think the, the mission of the, the CREMLO, if I got that acronym correct, uh, is, is, is more important than ever. Uh, and so I'm pleased to be here for that reason, too, because understanding a nation state's strategic culture is essential to understanding how these nation states interpret our actions and our policies and helps us identify the factors that will predict how they behave in ways that are most important for our senior most policymakers, war fighters, and planners. Now, before I dig in to Iran's strategic culture, an important caveat is in order. Iranians are not monolithic in their mindset, worldview, or outlook. When I'm describing Iran's strategic culture over the next several minutes, I'm mostly referring to the generation of Iranians that deposed the Shah of Iran during the Islamic Revolution and that experienced directly the effects of the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988. And those Iranians are true believers in the system, or Nizam in Farsi, that undergirds what we call today the Islamic Republic of Iran. So uh, now let's begin. Slide, please. Thank you. Oh, OK. Thank you, actually. Yeah. OK. So here we have uh, what I identify, at least, as the four key tenets of Iran's strategic culture. And we're going to start with the first one, which is Iranian identity, which is primarily a mix of Persian nationalism as well as Islam. So Persians are the largest and most prosperous ethnic group in Iran, comprising about 55 to 60 percent of the Iranian population. They are enormously proud of their history and their military, cultural, and other achievements. And Iranians across the political spectrum, whether you're a hardliner or you're a reformist in Iran, believe they're entitled to respect and regional influence, if not regional domination, by virtue of their grand, their grand history, and their culture, relatively large population. They are the second largest uh, state population-wise in the entire Middle East, behind Egypt as well as their uh, geography and their resources. And this, this view or perspective exists before the Islamic uh, Revolution occurred. Uh, and you could go back to the time of the Shah of Iran and argue that his policies were similar uh, in the sense of trying to achieve, regi achieve regi regional hegemony. Uh, and many argue that no matter what the nature of the Islamic government in power, uh, they're going to try to play an outsized role uh, in the region because of this perspective. Now, Iranian leaders like to boast about their 2,500 plus years as a grand civilization and uh, the numerous empires that thrived uh, during this time. Uh, and I'll point to one picture here on the slide. Where's the? Oh, here we go. Does anyone recognize what this is? Going once, twice. OK, those are the ruins of Persepolis, which was the capital of the great Iranian Achaemen, Achaemenid dynasty that existed from about the 6th to the 4th century BC. Uh, and it included not only uh, most of the Middle East, but also Turkey, as well as North Africa and the Indian sub some continent. Iranians are also proud of their language, Farsi, which survived the Arab conquests over Persia, and as such represents uh, uh, a symbol of Persian independence from foreign domination. Regarding Islam, the second part of Iranian identity, uh, it's certainly central to Iran, or the, the current regime. After all, the official name of the government is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran's connection to Shiism can be traced back to the Safavid dynasty in the 16th century which adopted Shiism as a state religion, and today over 80% of the population are Shias. This makes Iran unique in the region where Shias are a minority relative to Sunnis. The Islamic character of the Iranian regime 
uh, is apparent in its glorification of self-sacrifice and martyrdom, shah or shahadat in Farsi. And the regime views itself as, uh, oh, I wanted to point out one other picture. Does anyone know what's going, what this is commemorating, this picture up here? Exactly. We have some ringers in the audience, I can tell. <laughs> so the uh, Ashura commemorates the martyrdom of Imam Hussein at 680 in the epic battle of Karbala, which is in modern day Iraq. Uh, and it shaped uh, the Islamic Republic's view. Uh, and they see themselves as a sort of a modern a version of Imam Hussein, uh, who died at the Battle of Ashura on behalf of what are now Shias. Uh, and, and Iran sees itself as a modern manifestation of that, surrounded by evil adversaries. Okay. Now I'd like to turn to the second tenet of Iran's uh, strategic culture, which is uh, Iran as a resistance or Mokavamat uh, state. Uh, when Kissinger famously asked, is Iran a nation or a cause? This is the cause part of Iran's revolutionary regime. That is uh, ideology trumping uh, pragmatism and rationality. So the ideal of a Mokavamat or resistance manifests itself in Iran identifying uh, its, it, itself as defending the oppressed or the Mostazafin against the oppressors, the Mastakbarin. And this ideal as defender of the oppressed is actually enshrined in the Islamic Republic's constitution. And there are frequent quotes by Iranian officials warning off the West and other adversaries. Uh, for example, in July, uh, July, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force Commander, Ghassim Soleimani, uh, uh, said to the United States, do not threaten us with killing. We are thirsty for martyrdom and annihilation of arrogant powers. And those kind of statements are, are frequent from the Iranian uh, leadership. The Islamic Republic has a victimhood mentality, point, pointing frequently to injustices committed by foreign, pol foreign powers that once dominated Iran, including occupying its territory, interfering in its internal affairs, and expropriating Iranian natural resources. And Mokav Ahmad, or resistance, also manifests itself in Iran's self-perceived role as defender of Shias throughout the region. And Iran has set up what it calls this axis of resistance, which is a network of Shia militant and terrorist groups that operate in the region on Iran's behalf. All right, now we'll turn to the third element of Iran's strategic culture, and that's its more pragmatic tendency called uh, maslahat, or expediency. And this tends to constrain some of Iran's more revolutionary ideological impulses. So going back to the Kissinger, Kissinger construct, this is Iran as a nation over a cause. Now expediency in the Islamic Republic's context means pragmatism and flexibility to make compromises that are necessary to ensure survival of the regime. It entails a weighing of the cost, a very rational weighing the cost of benefits of regime policies and execution of those policies so it does not jeopardize the regime. Lastly, I'll turn to the impact of the Iran-Iraq war on Iran's strategic culture. The psyche of, uh, and the effect it had in the psyche of Iranians who lived through it, the lessons they drew from it and still carry with them today. So first, the Iran-Iraq war left uh, the Islamic regime of Iran with a sense of abandonment by the international community. From Iran's perspective, it was Saddam that initiated the war in 1980. It was Saddam who initiated the use of chemical warfare and the war of the cities involving the bombardment of population centers in Iran, uh, as well as the tanker war in the Persian Gulf, which ultimately dragged the United States directly into that conflict. Second, the arms embargo against Iran during the Iran-Iraq war and an arms embargo since have left the Islamic Republic with the conviction that it needed to be self-sufficient or as much as possible in order to survive. So Iran frequently touts its indigenous military industrial complex 
and the weapons that it produces. Uh, they, there's a tremendous amount of publicity associated not just with Iran's military exercises, but with the wep and there's weapons that they try to showcase in them. All right, so slide, please. Uh, sl slide? Oh, okay. All right, thank you. So now let me segue to challenges associated with Iranian strategic culture, the first of which is that Iran is uh, heavily inclined towards distrusting the United States and the West, our in both our intentions, our policies, and our actions in support of those intentions. And this perspective stems from a tendency to view U.S. policy through the prism of Washington and its regional partners as oppressors, seeking to dominate the region and undermine Iran and its Shia partners around the region. Iran also sees U.S. influence as an effort to undermine the regime. This was noted recently, as recent as this past weekend, when Supreme Leader Khamenei, commenting about the attack on the Iranian military parade at Avaz, said it was part of a, a U.S.-backed effort to create, quote-unquote, insecurity uh, in Iran. Iran's mistrust and hostility uh, also uh, explains uh, 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 Iran seeing U.S. influence in the region as a zero-sum game. They're not trying to somehow set up a, a shared spheres of influence. They view any U.S. influence as wrong and improper and are determined to push back on it. And Iran does invest heavily in this axis of resistance uh, uh, and in order to push back on U.S. influence in the region and the influence of U.S. partners there. A second challenge that I want to highlight is the Islamic Republic's tendency to see legitimate, indigenous, pro-reform sentiment in Iran as part of a plot by the West to foment a cultural war and undermine the revolution. And cultural war is a term that Iranian hardliners throw around all the time. The regime hardliners are deeply fearful of efforts aimed at political, social, and economic reforms within Iran, especially among the Iranian youth who were born after the Iran-Iraq War and the Islamic Revolution and whose adherence to the, this revolutionary ideal is waning over time. And the Iranian hardliners actually have a term, they call, they call it Garbzadeh, or West Toxification, meaning uh, an effort they think is driven by the West, led by the United States, uh, to uh, inculcate a Western culture among Iranian youth to undermine the ideals of Iran's revolutionary government. A third challenge stemming from the strategic culture is, Iran, is the Islamic Republic's sense of obligation to resist so-called oppressors. This could lead to Iran initiating an ill-advised conflict or escalating a conflict that's already underway. As already noted, the Islamic Republic invokes Imam Hussein and his epic battle of Karbala in 680 as the exemplar in which resistance equals victory. And a good example of this is a statement made, a public statement made by an Iranian military official some years ago. He said, quote, it is possible that the United States or some countries instigated by it might start a military conflict, but it will not be able to end it because only Muslims believe that whether we kill or are killed, we are victorious. Others, meaning the West, do not think this way. This factor can contribute to Iran taking very dangerous risks and very provocative actions. Examples include Iran's facilitation of the Lebanese Hezbollah bombing in 1983 of the U.S. Embassy and U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut, which killed hundreds of Americans. Also, their facilitation of the bombing of the U.S. military barracks in 1996 in Dahran, Saudi Arabia. And then in 2011, the uh, failed plot attempt to kill the uh, Saudi ambassador to the United States at a restaurant in Georgetown, in Washington, D.C. All right. Uh, finally, I'll shift to, shift to opportunities. Uh, slide, please. Thank you. Maslahat, or expediency, as I was discussing before, uh, gives the, IR, the Islamic Republic flexibility for strategic shifts. Examples include Ayatollah Khomeini agreeing to, quote, drink from the poison chalice, end quote, 
and enter into the 1988 ceasefire with the much hated Saddam Hussein that ended the Iran-Iraq war. Also, the 2003 decision by Iran's Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei, who's still the current Supreme Leader, to end its nuclear weapons program. And another shift was invoking what Khamenei called heroic flexibility to enter into the 2015 nuclear deal known as the JCPOA. Maslahat can also mitigate the likelihood of Iran escalating a conflict, particularly if the regime understands that Iranian provocations would be met with a severe response. And Iran tends not to take excessive risks uh, and responds with what it perceives to be a proportional response to adversaries' actions to mitigate the likelihood of escalation against strong adversaries. Examples of this include Supreme Leader Khamenei in 2011 stating that Iran would answer, quote, threats with threats. And in 2012, he declared that attacks uh, against an enemy uh, will be uh, met with the same level that they attacked us, end quote. All right, in the interest of time, I'll stop there. I look forward uh, to comments and questions during the discussion period. Uh, Dr. I, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hecker. A great presentation, which could be easily predicted, right, given his skills, knowledge, and expertise. Thank you very much. This is great. The next speaker is Mr. Jeffrey Vordermark, who will discuss Turkish aspects <laughs> of the strategic culture. Mr. Vordermark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahimov. All right. Well, first off, before I get started, I want to see how many folks in the audience have actually been to Turkey. Pretty good crowd. I like you. Yes, double count over here. All right. Hoş geldiniz. Hoş geldiniz to all of you. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to spend uh, a fair amount of my career, professional career, uh, in Turkey. And uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating country. And, and uh, I've had the opportunity to watch it change and evolve. Uh, so to go after what the specific strategic culture of the country is, uh, well, it, it, it's evolving as well. But uh, first off, uh, I was told years ago that, uh, you know, if you really want to get to know Turkey and the Turks, you got to understand kind of the, the, the mentality of the Turkish people and, and that there's four things you're never going to hear from a Turk. Those things are, I'm wrong, you're right, I'm sorry, and I love you. Now, those are the four things. You know, and, and the, the more time I spent in, in Turkey, I, I came to realize that's pretty on the mark. And so if you, if you look at that and cast it upon a personage, and in this case, we're gonna, I'll talk in a short while about uh, the current president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, some of that very much fits in terms of how, how you might want to interpret things through the lens of, of uh, President Erdogan. So uh, first off, Turkey's one of those, uh, you can see the map on the background there, uh, very interesting neighborhood. And uh, 68 million Turks within the country of 82 million. Uh, the remainder is largely Kurdish population. And um, with, uh, with that, they have distinct language, a very distinct culture, and clearly a distinct geography. Uh, I'm surprised at the number of people that I talk to, you know, uh, in, in daily conversation, and, and they want to know what language the Turks speak. And uh, do they speak Arabic or, you know, they speak Turkish. It's a very distinct language. And, and so that's the first eye-opener. Uh, it tells me that, that we have a lot to learn about the country. Uh, but uh, I, will, I will add that in terms of uh, they do have a very strong national identity and, and, and they have a very strong sense of nationalism. And this started, uh, of course, back at uh, uh, the end of World War I when, when the Turkish nation was formed out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire created a, a bit of a legacy and an identity that uh, the modern Turks don't necessarily identify with, but at the same time, uh, they understand that at one time they were somebody. Uh, so so uh, there's more to that as, as, as we go through as well. Uh, but with all this said, and oh, by the way, just as Iran is Persian and has a largely Shia influence, Turkey largely Sunni influence. And so there's this secular uh, struggle that goes on uh, between Turkey, it's more so now than it used to be, and perhaps Iran for, for kind of... Um, uh, influence in the region. Uh, so I'll hit that as well. Uh, but uh, historically, natural competitor with Iran, a natural competitor with Russia as well. 
uh, has vast ties to Europe, and of course those ties are largely economic these days. Uh, but uh, it also means, because of its Ottoman legacy, there's a little bit of baggage that it carries as well. Uh, and and to, uh, to point that out, I'll tell you another little homily that I, that I heard is that, uh, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, the Greeks and the Turks, they don't get along. And, and the, the standing joke was, well, what does a Greek think about when they wake up every morning? Okay, and, and the answer, of course, was always, well, it's Turkey. And then what does a Turk think about when they wake up? <laughs> Something different every day. And, and that, I think, is instructive in that the Turks feel that they are surrounded by challenges. Okay, so they got some, some pretty interesting neighbors. And uh, one of the uh, senior military staff members at one time told me, you know, Jeff, it's a pretty rough neighborhood you live in when your best friend is Bulgaria. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, but over, over the year, over the decades that I've been associated with Turkey, I've watched it grow, uh, watched it change, and, and the biggest change was that here you had this group of young people that suddenly were drawn by the lure of the big cities. And this, this, this urbanization, massive amount of urbanization, growing population in the you know, the, the, the saying was, oh, the streets of Istanbul are paved with gold. And so you wanted to, you wanted to go to Istanbul and make your fortune, so to speak. And, and I have been through Anatolian villages where there were no young people. They were not in evidence because they'd all gone, uh, gone to seek out their fortune. A very interesting set of dynamics. But along with that came, you know, this, this high standard of education that was, has been inculcated into the environment there in Turkey. And, and with that becomes, uh, of course, jobs, becomes industry, becomes economic growth. And so these, these are really huge drivers of what's going on. And so over a very short period of time, in just a couple of decades, massive amounts of people came from the countryside to the city. And this is the legacy of one Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. If I can have the next slide, please. So um, this is Ataturk, as he is known. And, and he was largely responsible for creating the, the modern country of Turkey out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. And, and he was famous for his six arrows, which are up there. And uh, a couple things to understand about that is the first was a very definite order or move to replace the old Ottoman order, uh, to get rid of the caliphate system, replace it with a system or an institutional system where you had a parliament and you had these organs of government that were very distinctly Western. Uh, so so uh, he went after that, and then he's held up this uh, idea of, of uh, uh, Turkey for the Turks, this idea of nationalism. And it wasn't just an ethnic piece, as, as George Linchowski wrote in his book about Turkey uh, or about Middle East history, but uh, one that said, you know, if, if you are within the confines of the geographic construct of modern Turkey, you're a Turk, whether you're an ethnic Armenian or an ethnic Greek or an ethnic whatever, uh, you're, you're a Turk, just like somebody from America is an American. And, and so that, that idea, he wanted to take root and, and hold. Um, and then, and then, of course, the, the revolutionism was that aspect of, of wholesale change away from the Ottoman system and one that came to a more republic system, a Western system that, uh, that, that he uh, instituted. This also meant no more caliphate. So in, in 1923, the caliphate goes away. And, of course, the caliphate in Islam, especially within Sunni Islam, is the central point and the legitimating authority within Islam. And so Islam now has no caliphate to look to uh, for that. Uh, but it is not going to be reinstituted within Ataturk's Turkey. So this was part of that culture that, that came about. And of course, uh, over time, uh, as I said, the, the economy, society, everybody, everybody came uh, uh, into the cities. Uh, the other issue of, of Turkey itself was that it was a very uh, quiescent power in terms of not imposing its will on others. It had a non-interventionist foreign policy. And this held sway all the way up until uh, the early 2000s when the AK Party, or the uh, current party that is in, in charge in Turkey, uh, kind of changed it to uh, a no problem with neighbors uh, uh, policy, which is now kind of on the outs as well. Uh, but the whole idea was peace at home, peace in the world. This was the mantra. And, and so uh, that was largely what shaped their, their foreign policy and, and, and uh, certainly how they dealt with the region. Now, in the, in the time, in the interim from, from Ataturk, they became members of NATO, uh, became very closely allied with, with European countries, and uh, tried to get into the European Union. Uh, but as I said, they also urbanized and industrialized. And uh, this, this changed things quite a bit because 
during that time frame, the people who came from the countryside were kind of seen as, you know, not with the elites. Uh, they were much more uh, uh, rough in their character, so to speak, and, and weren't necessarily brought in to the fold. And plus, they, had, they didn't have the money and the jobs to go along with it. But under Turkish culture, uh, they have this idea of a gece kondu. And gece kondu, literally a term that means put up overnight. So if you go to a big city and you find a plot of land and you can put a roof over your head in 24 hours, it's yours. Well, there are millions of Turks that did this, and yet they were disenfranchised from the ruling or the elite uh, Turkish political parties. But the ones that found them out and brought them into the fold in terms of a grassroots movement were the predecessors of the AK Party. And uh, next thing you know, they became a, a true political power. And of course, now you see this idea that, that perhaps there's been some change in Turkey. And that is uh, inherent in this idea of, of what it's come to today. And if I can get the next slide, uh, you have this man, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. He's been running the country for about a decade and a half, essentially. He started off as, as uh, you know, in a presidential role, and, and by constitutional law, the presidential role was largely a figurehead. Uh, the true power was held by the prime minister through parliament. Uh, that changed very much recently. Uh, and, and there's been this idea that, hey, you know, there's this, Turkey's going to, they're trying to be more neo-Ottoman in their approach to things and their foreign policy and, and what have you. And, and that does not mean, by definition, a, a, a return to regional primacy, it did not, not regional hegemony, and certainly not an expansion of, of Turkish territories. What it does mean is that Turkey has tried to cast themselves as the arbiter, the negotiator in the region, and the primary Sunni voice within the region. So you see that, that, that symbol that he's throwing up there, that is the Rabia, which is a symbol that is for the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, now, there are those that don't necessarily hold the Muslim Brotherhood in very high regard. But when Morsi was elected in Egypt as the president, uh, President Erdogan took a visit and was greeted as an absolute rock star. When Morsi was overthrown, basically, uh, and replaced by the current President Sisi, uh, they now have very frosty relations because this meant that Turkish influence within Egypt uh, was up and suddenly down, and, and uh, this did not obviously fare well with uh, Erdogan, but uh, that's an influence issue. Erdogan sees himself as a real player and has interjected himself even into the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Now, previously, the Turks had and were the first uh, Muslim nation to recognize Israel as a country. Okay, so they had very close ties with Israel. There was a defense and economic cooperation agreement. Uh, that's been on the wane now because of this change in the way Erdogan wants to project himself and, and, and position Turkey as a champion of Sunni and Muslim rights in the region. Okay, and of course, the, obs or the obvious uh, foil for that is, is Iran. Uh, if you think about it. So um, um, there's that. This idea of conformism is, is really uh, the more worrisome piece of it. Is It, it, it is uh, a form of loyalism, and, and it is one that says, hey, you know, we had this coup in 2016, and part of the narrative, the accepted narrative, is it was kind of sort of U.S.-backed. Well, that's because we have this gentleman named Fethullah Gulen living in exile in Pennsylvania, and he has uh, he has been there for a while. Uh, Erdogan has demanded that he be remanded uh, over to Turkish custody, custody because he's a terrorist. He heads this Fethullah Gulen terrorist organization and clearly is an enemy of the state. Well, that's curious because they were allies up until about 2011. So uh, uh, whatever suited at the time. And there was a coup attempt. Uh, the background of the coup attempt, uh, still a little murky, but the bottom line is that Erdogan came out of, his str out of much stronger. Uh, he was able to use and take those people that he thought were the opposition and arrest them or otherwise basically muzzle them. So the press has been muzzled. Uh, the press is now an organ of the state. Uh, the, the world's foremost incarcerator of journalists is none other than Turkey, which is an unusual, I think a bit of a disturbing factor when you think about it, uh, considering their NATO alliance and ties to the West. But uh, he demands loyalism, and, and he demands it within his civil service, his military, the police structure. And so he has appointed all the police chiefs in the provinces. Okay, that's like appointing, you know, the police chief in Chicago and, and you know, you name it, Philadelphia and everywhere else. 
Uh, he has an immense amount of power and has about, had about 160,000 people within the civil service and military and other organs of state arrested. If you want to equate that to U.S. terms, that'd be about 640,000 Americans in jail because of the coup. So uh, just think about that. This is a big change. Uh, but in the interim, he has been able to establish reelections, change the Constitution, and he is now essentially, as some have, have termed it, a, an autocrat because the organs of state revolve around him. He is, there is no prime minister anymore. He has his super executive presidency. He appoints academic heads. He appoints a large number of the judiciary, so an independent judiciary is not part of the mix. And um, uh, yeah, so enough said on that. Uh, but the other thing to talk about is just conservatism, and that's a return to the more con uh, conventional, traditional values of, of the Turkish uh, hinterland, so to speak. And, and I think I kind of addressed a bit about that with the Gece Kondu aspect and, and the folks coming to uh, Istanbul and, and Ankara and the other, the other big cities, but from the countryside. Uh, so um, uh, that idea of ox rise to power, it remains there. Uh, so you have uh, quite a bit of uh, change going on with the in the country. But I think the biggest thing to understand is that if you're going to look at what Turkey's doing in the world or in the region or in, inside Turkey, you need to look at what Erdogan's personal interests are going to be in that and how it positions him. Because he has changed the paradigm from that nationalist republic idea and secular idea that, that Ataturk represented and, and, and kind of turned that on his head a little bit. And I will stop there. Dr. Ibrahimov, back to you. Thank you so much. You've done this, such a great job. Very interesting, uh, very interesting present. Another interesting presentation, and you done even better job pronouncing my last name. Fool my <laughs> last name. So that was good. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ordemark. That's great. Um, so next slide, please. At this time, Dr. Nikol Seberstad will discuss the Russian demographics and its possible implications for U.S. national security. Is everybody still good? Is it still interesting? For Friday, you know, we're going to stay here for about five, five hours. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. Dr. Eberstadt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maya. I won't talk for more than four or five hours on this. <laughs> uh, so um, not culture I'm going to be on. I'm going to be on demographics. Demographics, I think, is one of the foundations of national power, not just the head count, but the composition and sex of the population, the skills, the health, uh, the education, all of those uh, conduce towards economic potential, which conduce towards military potential. Um, a nice thing about demographics is more than economic forecasts or political forecasts or, God help us, technological forecasts, we can look into the future tolerably well. We can see what the population profile is going to look like in 5 or 10 or even 15 years because the 5-year-olds are going to be 10 and the 10-year-olds are going to be 15 and so forth. The overwhelming majority of people in Russia in 2035 are already there now. So it makes it a little bit easier to do that. Um, there was a guy named uh, Auguste Comte who said demography is destiny. Auguste was a genius but he was also a Frenchman, and he was also a socialist, and I am none of those things. So if I were to offer a friendly American amendment, I would say that demographics slowly but very unforgivably alters the realm of the possible, right? Because like there's human will, decisions and things. Um, what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is uh, why I think there is a big disconnect between the Kremlin's ambitions and the national power base that those ambitions are based on. And for the life of me, I'm not smart enough to see why this is sustainable. It looks to me like a big attitude adjustment is coming, somehow or other. Uh, so first slide, please. Um, this is just the head count of uh, what's happened uh, in the recent past with Russian Federation population. At the end of the Cold War, Russia went into a big bout of depopulation. 
polling population because the birth rates collapsed and the death rates exploded. Um, things stabilized a few years ago and um, uh, President Putin figured out a really neat new pronatalist policy. It's called annexing neighbor in nearby territory, but, uh, but that has its limits too. Um, next one, please. Next slide. Um, if you look at the um, if you look at the balance between births and deaths uh, in the 20 years between the collapse of the Soviet Union and let's say 2012, there is no country in the world which had such an enormous surfeit of deaths over births as the Russian Federation. The last time we saw anything like this happen was in the three lean years after the Great Leap Forward in Maoist China. Uh, it's the only time in post-war history we've seen anything bigger than this. Um, right now, births and deaths are just uh, about in balance in Russia, but stay tuned, folks, because I don't think that's going to be true for long. Next slide, please. Um, if you're a demographer and you do all this pointy-headed nerd stuff, you do things like this sort of chart. So let me try to tell you what I'm trying to do here before you fall asleep. Uh, Family formation is the basis for you know, continuation of the species and all. Uh, and there's a European uh, style of family formation now, below replacement fertility with a fairly high proportion of births outside of marriage. Um, if you take a look at where Russia is and what they're doing, this part is a totally European story now, which is a long-term sub-replacement fertility story with increasingly fragile families. Um, there are some other things that aren't so European. I'm going to mention them in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's always a little bit problematic to count populations by their religious adherence. Uh, it's illegal in the United States for the Census Bureau to ask people what their religion is. There are other countries like Russia where they don't do it either, although some people try to get a head count, most uh, notably, obviously, for the population of Islamic heritage. Um, it's hard to tell exactly what significance to make of the fact that Russia's got such a high proportion of so-called population from uh, cultural background from Islam. Um, there are quite a few people in Russia who are of the uh, vodka-drinking, uh, pork-eating sect of Islam, apparently, so you don't really know what this is going to mean in practice. But it's worth bearing this in mind because it may have something to do with social cohesion in the future, just to mention. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So, um, I said that I thought that Russia was only in a temporary balance of births and deaths. Why did I say that? This is why I said that. Um, on the one hand, you look at that blue line, that's the total population to date and the future projection of this population of women 20 to 34. That's the big group in which most people in Russia have babies, women have babies, okay? And we've got a pretty good idea of how many, uh, how many women are gonna be in that group to 2040 because they've all been born already, okay? Um, virtually all have been born already. Uh, at the same time that you see this slump in prospective childbearing female population, you also see a gradual increase in the median age of the Russian population. Median age meaning like half is older than this, half is younger than this. So um, as even if, a, even if Utah and Florida have the same life expectancy, there's gonna be a higher death rate in Florida, right? Because it's like a grayer population, there's gonna be a higher, okay. So, even if, there, even if everything was the same in terms of health, the death count is gonna get higher in Russia. At the same time that there's going to be enormous pressure on total numbers of births. You know, uh, so, women in 2026 would have to be having almost twice as many births that year as back in 1990 
for there to be kind of equal numbers of births, total births in Russia, if you see what I mean. This is why this gap is opening and why Russia is heading towards great depopulation pressure. But I've just talked about the things which are kind of similar to Europe. There's depopulation pressure in Europe too. Let me talk just for two or three minutes about the things that are totally un-European. Number one, uh, and I don't really know how to be diplomatic about this, so I won't. Uh, there is a health catastrophe that has been unfolding in r the Russian territory since the Soviet days. Um, and this is not Nick making this stuff up. This is the World Health Organization. If you look at World Health Organization current estimates of life expectancy for a 15-year-old guy, male, 15-year-old, life expectancy today is like two or three years lower than his counterpart in the country of Haiti, H-A-I-T-I. That's World Health Organization, not Nick. Okay. So uh, there are equally horrifying things that I could tell you uh, about the female health situation isn't quite as bad, but horrifying things. Uh, trends are quite alarming. Um, it would be kind of unfair to say that Russia today uh, has a third world uh, health profile, because that would be kind of uh, unfair to the third world. Um, this is it's an absolutely shocking crisis, especially for working age people's health. Uh, one problem. Another problem is knowledge production. So Russia has about 2% of the world's population, about 4% of the world's uh, college, university educated population, and it produces about 3 tenths of 1% of global international patent applications. It's like a Soviet factory. There's like a huge amount of resources going in. There's nothing coming out. And that's not because people in Russia are not smart and talented and, you know, uh, I've got great potential. If, if you've met people from Russia, you know they do. There's something institutionally seriously wrong, uh, which uh, accounts for this. Um, Put all of these factors together, and you see on the horizon the possibility that Russia's, the national foundations of Russian economic influence, global influence, may be headed down rather fast because the world is a moving target. The world, apart from Russia, is exploding with health. The world is exploding with knowledge production. It's also exploding with education. And Russia's share of all of this looks to be set on a very steep downward slope. And so thus, this gets over to your challenge, ladies and gentlemen. You have a very ambitious uh, leadership configuration in Russia today with what looks to me like an increasingly frail base for power. Uh, can this go on forever? I don't think so. Uh, may it end in a rather tricky way? I fear possibly. Um, but if you look at the demographics of the situation, it may give insight to all of you for how we can best address this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very interesting. I even took some notes. <laughs> so. Uh, wonderful. That's great. Um, One of the outstations, real quick. Uh, so, Ma'am, sir, it's going to be the uh, sir, <laughs> question of answer session is going to be after the speaker's brief. So I'm going to announce when the, the, the questions and answers uh, session will begin. It should be like in about 10 minutes. I mean, actually, about yeah, 15 it's, minutes. It's not really a question. It's, it's a statement, but I'll hold on. I'll wait until the question is answered. It's okay. not a question, it's a statement. Yes, sir. Um, okay. Uh, next slide, please. So, and finally, Mr. Mark Wilcox will cover the rest of Russia aspects and also implications for U.S. national security. Mr. Wilcox, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Dr. I. I, I 
I'm a baseball fan. I got here, and I figured I'm fourth in the batting order here. I got a chance to hit a grand slam. This will be great. Um, that assumes we got on base. Well, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, I find my problem quite the opposite. The bases truly are empty these because all my predecessors have hit home runs. So I'm a bit stuck. So hopefully I, I will keep the rally going, not whiff or pop out to the catcher as I go along. Uh, and, and following up on Dr. Eberstadt's rather depressing picture, but I think quite realistic picture for Russia. It's certainly worth looking at, you know, what is it that is Russian strategic culture? And as I, as I approached this, I, I went and looked, so what the heck, what is strategic culture? And it, it's a good point that Dr. Ide made at the beginning, because a lot of the consideration of strategic culture goes back to looking at the Soviet Union. Why, why were the Western powers unable to figure out what the Soviet Union was up to? Um, and so you have scholars like Colin Gray, who cited Russia as example in their work talking about what he called typically Russian thought ways and modes of behavior which are deeply rooted and as a consequence likely to persist far into the future. So I thought I was in pretty good shape. Then I checked another source, uh, a rather voluminous work by William Fuller called Strategy and Power in Russia, 1600-1914. Uh, and then he came out and said to argue that there is or was one unitary Russian strategic culture is perforce to ignore and or overlook exceptions and consistencies, competing traditions, and human agency. There is not now, nor was there ever, a uniform and immutable Russian strategic culture. Well, heedless of that warning, I'm going to go on anyway um, and, and, and try to do what, what Andrew Kutchins called in a night, an October 2009 article, figure out why Russia is so Russian. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to look at three factors that I see as, as playing key roles, uh, geography, history, and identity. And I originally came up with those three factors. I had to give a presentation on Russian intervention in Ukraine some time ago. And as I started looking at why they did this, I thought, wow, these, these seems to be, seem to be real constants here. And I think there's, there's, a, a, there's goodness in looking at them and understanding why the Russians truly are so Russian. Slide, please. So the first factor is geography. And, and I, I think it's sort of a no-brainer to realize geography plays a role in what the Russians do, how they look at their country, how they look at the world around them. Um, if you look at the size and distances involved in Russia, you realize there is a security challenge in terms of dealing with external actors. There's also a significant internal governance challenge, which governs a lot of what the Russians do as well. And if you look at going back to the time of the Mongol invasion and, and the ending of that around 1240, what we find is that as Russia enlarges or expands, NATO enlarges, Russia expands. As, but as Russia has been expanding throughout the years, what they find themselves doing is bumping up against various empires, kingdom, etc. the British, Chinese, Persian, Ottoman, the Poles, the Swedes, you name it, the Russians are bumping into them. And what that does is create a whole new series of security challenges um, because while more territory may be seized to create more security, at the end of the day, it also provides additional insecurities that help inform Russian behavior. Um, and you see that especially the map on the top from the Tsarist period. I, I like that a lot. I used to talk to my wife's seventh grade classes about Russia. And I'd always show them this map and say, look, at here's a country. Start off on one end of the country, expand to the Pacific Ocean. Does that sound familiar to you? And they say, oh, yeah, it's the United States, right? No, it's not. It's Russia, too. Um, so this is what leads to a lot of those friction points. And even if we look at what happens then after the Second World War, Russia once again is seeking security through expansion by establishing the satellite states throughout Eastern Europe. But again, it ends up as a source of additional insecurity because as the Warsaw Pact ends, the Cold War comes to an end, suddenly you have these countries clamoring to go elsewhere uh, and, and, and going into NATO. Uh, and, and it's interesting, the Russians will say NATO was primary a supply issue, whereas I think more realistically, NATO expansion, enlargement, sorry, I said expansion, NATO enlargement was more a demand issue. These new countries were looking for protection. They were looking for new alignments. Uh, so again, geography influencing Russian behavior. And then we have, we put the two things together, geography and governance together, and we get into the sense of what's called the importance of the state or the gasudarstva, as Russia is called in Russia. 
Um, and it's interesting, with, with this kind of a governance challenge, as you see in the bottom two maps, you see these large amount of administrative structures on the left small map and say, how do you govern all that stuff? And what the, and the Russians have grappled with that for years. And there we see what Putin did was to take all those massive amounts of little divisions and create a number of larger structures to help manage that and manage that from the top. This is not bottom-up governance. This is top-down governance. Uh, and, and Putin kind of illustrated the, accept, the importance of this um, in something called the Millennium Manifesto, which he published in 1999, shortly before, much to everyone's surprise, he suddenly became president when Boris Yeltsin resigned. And he said, the state and its institutions and structures have always played an exceptionally important role in the life of the country and the people. For Russians, a strong state is not an anomaly to fight against. Um, so that gets to that, I think, those two issues of governance, the attendant insecurity, and how Russia tries to grapple with that. Slide, please. The next factor, and it's, that's, that's common through a lot of writings we'll see about culture, strategic culture, whatever kind of culture you're talking about, is certainly the role of history. And in fact, Putin himself draws quite a bit on history, both as an, an influence for how Russia acts, uh, but he also uses it as a, tool, as a tool. In fact, I would argue that Putin and the current Russian regime have weaponized history as a means of pursuing policy as well. Um, and in fact, a very good piece on this was written by Fiona Hill, who's currently the senior director for Russia on the National Security Council, uh, and Clifford Gaddy called Putin and the Uses of History. And they also had a shorter version of it called Putin and His League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, uh, being various figures throughout Russian history that Putin relies on. But the first one I have on the top is, is, is Gorbachev. That's not a typo. It wasn't supposed to be Gorbachev, and I just botched it up. Okay. It actually refers to uh, Count Alexander Gorbachev. And he was basically the foreign minister for the Tsar uh, in the mid 1800s. And what he refers to there is something called Russia is concentrating. After the Russians lost the Crimean War rather badly from 1853 to 1856, he issued instruction out to all Russian diplomats basically saying, we are, yeah, we've been beaten, we know we've been beaten, we are going to lay low for a while and we're going to reconstitute ourselves, and then we will re reassert ourselves again. And it's interesting, Putin once again draws on this as well. He, he published a series of essays in 2011 before one of his re-elections as president. It's hard to keep track of them right now. Uh, and, and the title of his article on foreign policy was, was exactly this, Russia, Russia Concentrates, or as it was translated into English on the Kremlin web, web, website, Russia Muscles Up. Um, and and it, it's, it shows this whole cycle of defeat, concentration over time with the assumption there's going to be pain and sacrifice for everyone involved during that period, and then resurgence again. And I think that's a lot of what we see throughout Russian history, and we're seeing it again today. And, and the, the point of reassertion, I would suggest, came around 2007 when Putin made a rather famous speech now to the Munich Security Conference in which he lashed out at the United States, unipolarism, NATO, OSCE, uh, probably baby seals were in there somewhere too, and, and basically said Russia is back and everybody needs to look out. The second historical point I bring up is the Bolshevik Revolution. You think, oh wow, that's gotta be a big deal for, for Putin, and it is a big deal for Putin, but not in the way you might think. Although he did say that the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, he is nonetheless not a big fan of revolutions. And it's worth noting that last year, 2017, the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, it's like you could hear the crickets chirping in Russia. Nothing to see here, no revolution to see here. So revolutions are bad for business, and it's not something that the Russians look well upon. In fact, Putin likes to look more back on Pyotr Stalipin who was Tsar Nicholas's prime minister and a gradual reformer rather than the Bolsheviks in terms of history. Uh, next, next period is the Great Patriotic War. For those of you who don't know, World War II did not start in 1939. It actually started in June of 1941 with the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Everything before 1941, again, nothing to see here. Don't worry about the pact between the Soviet Union and Germany over Poland. Nothing to see here there. But the Great Patriotic War is now a huge part of the Russian narrative, 
and also influencing their behavior. It is a sacred cause, and God help you if you falsify history, as is now a popular way of criticizing it, and say anything bad about what the Russians or what the Soviets did in the Second World War. And in fact, there's even, there's, there is a patriotic park now, it's called Park Patriot, outside of Moscow that glorifies the Great Patriotic War. Even to the point of having built a small-scale replica of the Reichstag in Berlin that your kids can go and storm just like Soviet troops at the end of the Second World War. You, I, you can't make this up. You can't make this up. And then the last historical moment I bring up is, is the period of rule under Boris Yeltsin after the fall of the Soviet Union. And this simply becomes the poster boy for what we don't want to be. Anytime people may express a little displeasure with the current government, you always get the, well, it could be worse. Remember what it was like under Yeltsin? He says, oh my gosh, that was terrible. We, we certainly don't want to go in that direction. Slide, please. And the last factor I want to conclude is, is identity. And, and the first one is this, this feeling of Russianness and the idea of a Ruski Mir, a Russian war, world. It, it's the whole idea of, of a Russian people and something unique about the Russian people we've seen throughout Russian history. Um, whether it be the peasant living in the Mir in his little village or the new Soviet man or now the, issue, the whole issue of who is a Russian. It's been a big influence on how the Russians think, how they look at the world, and, and how they approach pretty much every area of policy. And we've also seen it in a rationale, a justification for Russia to take action against its neighbors. And it's important to realize when the Soviet Union broke up, about, I wanna say about 24 million ethnic Russians suddenly found themselves outside of the Russian Federation. And it has become part of policy, it's become part of strategy now that the Russian state uh, will kind of take responsibility for all these Russians uh, and in fact reserves the right to act anytime, anywhere uh, in support of them as well. And we've seen this in Georgia, we've seen this in Ukraine as well in terms of informing how the Russians think and approach these issues. The second bullet kind of gets down to, so not only who are we, but where are we? Are Russians Eastern, are they Western, or are they something in between? And, and, and I think more and more you're seeing this unique sense of Eurasianism as Russia being something special, something very, very unique, and something better than everybody else. And this ties into a bit of social conservatism. It also ties into the role that the Orthodox Church is now playing in Russian thinking, and has historically always played in Russian thinking as well, that unique rever view of the church. And then the last point here, the last factor, is the sense of being a great power. Derzhavnos, there's actually a word for it in Russian. I don't know in English, you could say great powerness, that's an awkward, awkward word. But in Russian, derzhavnos, no problem, got a word for that. And this really cuts to the heart of Russian identity, this view that they, ha they are, have been, always will be a great power um, in terms of where they sit on the Eurasian landmass as being the third Rome, as being a voice that speaks out about the decadent West and all that. So great powerness is certainly a huge part of, of what they do and how they think. So with that, I will conclude my comments and give the floor back to you, уважаемый господин товарищ Ибрагимов. Спасибо. Пожалуйста. Thank you so much, Mr. Wilcox. Uh, we just briefly spoke in Chinese right now. I'm sorry, it was Russian. <laughs> so, um, Thank you so much. This is such a great combination of expertise. Everybody would agree with that, right? That's fascinating. I, I really enjoyed that so far, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you will continue enjoying it. So next slide, please. This is, uh, now is the time for questions, answers, and comments, including the outstations. They're welcome to join us at any time. If the outstations will give us a few more minutes, we'll be ready for you. And if you don't mind, audience, we'll give the first question we promised whomever was, I, I think it was for Benny. So, but I would like to share some instructions with you, how to use VTC and uh, what needs to be done in the audience. So you need to introduce yourself, ask a question or make a comment. Please be concise. In the past we had somebody made a comment which lasted for 20 minutes. So that's okay, it indicates the passion, but we wanna try to be a little bit concise, right? So, uh, so that everybody has a chance to participate. 
Uh, please use the microphones on the tables. Make sure a green light is on. You need to push the green light, the button to for make sure the green light is on because it's being video recorded. Otherwise, we'll not be able to record that. Multiple outstations are welcome to participate in the discussion at any time. If I may, just to generate a discussion, I would like to pose the first question to the panel, trying to confuse them, okay? So given the strategic culture of each of these individual countries, what possible approaches could the US and its international partners apply to address their national security challenges? The, the, the panel, if, who would like to begin with? Uh, Mr. Hecker, please. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, uh, thanks, it's, a, it's an excellent question. In, in my presentation, I did talk about uh, opportunities uh, for US policymakers uh, in the context of Iran's strategic culture. Uh, what I'll, I'll just, so I'll just take a, a couple moments uh, and pass the baton here to my colleagues uh, since some of this has already been covered. But uh, we can, U.S. policymakers can certainly appeal uh, to the Iranian sense of, of expediency, of maslahat, of, of flexibility in their decision making, a willingness to compromise uh, their ideals uh, in, in, in order to not endanger um, regime, sur regime survival, regime legitimacy, both at home uh, and, and abroad. There's another aspect of the strategic culture which I didn't have time to go into, um, which is uh, the Persian term is uh, abaru, which is face, saving face, which is very important to, uh, to Iranians. Um, so um, U.S. policymakers um, maybe want to shy away from uh, statements that may be seen as very insulting uh, and and uh, push uh, Iranians into, into a corner from which they think their only uh, response would be to kind of fight their way out of that with, bomb with bombastic uh, anti-US uh, rhetoric. Um, those would be the kind of, um, uh, of approaches uh, I, I would uh, suggest. Thank you very much, Mr. Hecker. Anybody else? Awesome, just, just on the uh, aspect of uh, Turkey, uh, it would seem, if you were a Turk these days, to, to appear that they weren't very much loved by the United States uh, based on, you know, we just Im implemented some sanctions, and you go back to the comment about the 2016 coup and the fact that, you know, maybe the, the Americans are behind it. And we still haven't given over this, uh, this reprobate Fethullah Gulen, you know, to, to the Turks. Uh, you know, that's certainly out there. And then, of course, we, we go into Syria and we arm uh, what is a, uh, a very – distinct enemy of, of the Turks, and that, that would be the YPG associated with the PKK. And I, I neglected to talk about the PKK, uh, but just understand that, that most of Turkey's reactions regarding the PKK are specific to a, a real existential sovereign sovereignty issue, a threat to their territory. That is not to conflate or, or confuse the Kurds proper. If you look at what's going on in Turkey over the last three decades or so, uh, very, very many Tur Kurds have left the southeast and have moved to Istanbul, moved to Ankara, moved to the other big cities, and they are much more interwoven in the fabric of Turkey's, Turkish society. And so the constant idea that the PKK is the issue uh, is, is out there. But I, I think that uh, over the long term, in terms of U.S. national uh, policy, understand that, that uh, just as, you know, the Iranians have their own pragmatic approach, the Turks very much, even if it's Erdogan at the helm or anybody else, uh, have, a, have a realpolitik aspect to the way they do business, and they very much understand the long term. Uh, so so if, we, if we get by the current kerfluffles that are out there, uh, I, I think we can see our way through in that regard. Dr. Ederstad? Sure. Um, a first point that I'd make is that there is a difference in worldview and in uh, perceived interests between the Kremlin and a lot of the so-called middle class people in Moscow or intellectuals who I know, uh, very different views of the world. Um, the people that I'm friendly with, I think we could work out a lot of win-win solutions. The people running the Kremlin today, I'd say rather uh, not so much. As Mark was saying, there's um, whether one looks at uh, 
the Kremlin's viewpoint as a restorationist one, as Mark was saying, which I think there's a lot of uh, argument for, or as a revisionist power, um, restorationists and revisionists don't often see a lot of win-win in the world. They see more win-lose. We win, you lose is better than everybody sharing on things. Um, I am not at all a, uh, a military guy, so I will leave it to those of you who understand this stuff to talk about Article 5 and NATO and where the pressure points are in the Baltics and all of that. But from my own background, I can tell you that one of the areas we haven't used nearly as much as we could or should is our, uh, financial, uh, our financial strength. Uh, for the time being, maybe for a long time being, the U.S. dollar is the uh, reserve currency of the world, and people who uh, don't want to play nicely with us uh, don't uh, get the privilege, if we don't want to give it to them, of uh, doing transactions and clearances in U.S. dollars. We've got the equivalent of what you might call a financial death star called uh, secondary financial sanctions. And uh, if, you're, you know, if you're just the uh, Vineshtorg Bank Kitai that deals with ruble and Chinese, you know, the renminbi stuff, you can probably survive our Death Star, but otherwise you probably can't. Uh, we should be using this, I think, much more against infractions by the kleptocracy in Moscow than we have been doing. And in addition, um, I do not know whether it is true or not that, uh, that Vladimir Putin is the world's richest man. There are many people who say uh, he, ha he is the world's richest man. Uh, if he is, most of that money is in the West, and most of that money can be seized because it is illegally garnered and gathered. Uh, and like any other sort of quasi-mafia organization, money is the elixir which uh, makes everything work. That was also true with the Nazis. Um, you know, not, not reducio ad Hitlerum, but that was also true back in under Uncle Adolf. Uh, if you deprive the leadership of its oxygen, you deprive it of a lot of its ability to compete. And we haven't been nearly fast enough and sharp enough in doing that with, uh, in, in our situation with the Kremlin. Thank you, Dr. Eberstadt. Mr. Wilcox? Um, yeah, I guess the only thing I would add about Russia is, is is the fact that what we may need to do is one thing that, that generally we Americans lack is be patient. It's, it's just going to take time. I think there, there was a pretty good example of, of maybe how to approach the issue by a guy named Kennan who, who <laughs> developed it some decades ago, is, is understanding that there are significant flaws within the system and that at some point it's likely to collapse of its own accord and to continue pressing at various points as necessary, but then be ready for when the whole thing breaks apart, because I think as Dr. Everstadt hinted, it might not be pretty when the demographics and, and all these other issues all come together uh, and the whole system comes apart. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. <laughs> Thank you so right much. Now. Very interesting, very interesting. So now the fl floor is yours. As promised, we would like to get back to the outstation if everybody is okay with that. So I think, I believe it was Fort Benning. Are you, sir, still up? Yes, sir. I am. Uh, I am uh, the director of global new generation uh, here at MCUE and industry school. My name is Ivan Vitanov. Dobry den, kakila. Uh, I would like to share my thoughts and provide some caution in some of the, uh, first of all, thank you for the panelists uh, for your share uh, information. But I would like to start it with two things. Uh, number one, uh, my challenge will be to keep it short because uh, there's the discussion we're having today, it's taking days, years, and months to uh, dissect. I'll start with this. Um, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, or state, non-state actors identified in the national defense strategy today. Uh, it's something that requires a in-depth analysis. And the reason I say that is uh, and I could go later with the panelists. I disagree with all their assessments as far as Russia's demographics, health, uh, health system, et cetera, et cetera. Number one, 
we need to understand the modern world is a global, multipolar, multilateral world. And the players we discussed today have uh, intertwined connections in the global initiatives. And to, to kind of put it in perspective, the 73rd United Nations General Assembly is taking place today. And if we listen to the statements made by global uh, international leaders, the one thing is very evident. And the one thing that's very evident is that the global zero-sum strategic competitive game is the game of today. Uh, and I'm just going to summarize it because it, it, we could talk about it for a while. The, the instruments of national power, I mentioned in the national security strategy, national defense strategy, national nuclear posture review, and NDA, our adversaries, Russia and China, have mastered it. We have not. And the problem is we got to be fair with ourselves first. And I hate using Seng Tzu, but I will say knowing yourself is where you know you, as well as you know your enemies fear in a thousand battles. I don't think we know ourselves well enough or our adversaries well enough. Uh, so that's step one. And the reason I said it is that I'm piggyback on the last comment as far as the Russian economy. Um, first of all, the Russian economy is doing quite well can compare it to the American economy or Chinese economy, but uh, as far as national debt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, um, Senator Cotton, and Secretary Mattis have identified the number one threat to national security are national debt. As of today, national debt is $21 trillion. Uh, and what makes it more risky for us is the national debt is owned, 70% uh, of it is owned by us. And I'll leave that one alone because it's a whole different topic. I want to close it out with this, that all the countries you guys briefed today are really the cornerstones of the counterbalance in Eurasia. The one thing we cannot do is look at them individually. So Russia and China have a strategic uh, partnership globally. Iran is right along with them and Turkey is getting closer and closer. So I want to close it out with this. We got to be very cautious of underestimating the dynamics of the modern world, the interconnectivity and the capabilities of our adversaries using international organizations such as, such as BRISC, China, Russia, India, and Brazil, South Africa, Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, another example, uh, um, Commonwealth of International States, uh, Independent States, uh, ASEAN, and I could go down the list as far as capabilities that our adversaries, and you're right, sir, Putin is the richest man in the world, but unfortunately for us, the modern world does not receive sanctions in any shape or form, and we could talk about GPCPOA and RN and all that in a reference to it was 20 years ago. So there's, due to interconnectivity of the modern world, uh, a lot of these sanctions we impose in one or two late, two, they're not as uh, productive as we would like them to see. Um, and there's other tools we could use. So I'll stop talking because we could talk about this for a while. I appreciate your time uh, and sharing my perspective on it. And I'll just one more, one more, one more time, I'll caution uh, some of the assessments because uh, in my personal opinion, we're way behind. And I'll close it with this. We're no longer champions, we're contenders. And we, as long as we, we understand that, uh, we as a military, the civilian leadership and the rest of the the big five, political, diplomatic, economical, information warfare, and militarily, will be able to have the opportunity to uh, change the balance. But currently, the balance is not in our favor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the comment. Appreciate that. So uh, now the floor, if there are no other outstations, we just promise to get back to them so we can turn to our audience. Anybody would like to ask a question, make a comment. If you are in the back seat, I forgot to mention that. Please use those two microphones because you are video recorded, right? Please, ma'am, the floor is yours. It should be on. It is on. Oh, it's on, Don't okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's you good afternoon. Up. I'm too short. Um, my name is Stephanie Kitraru. I'm the USAID uh, Chair here for Development Studies. Uh, I've waited a long time for this talk. Thank you so much for you guys coming out here today. Uh, I love the demographic chat. Um, I like the last chat until talking about let it kind of implode. I have to respectfully disagree 
we're missing a lot of windows of opportunity right now um, in the periphery countries around the Russian world. It's not just Ruski Mir. It's now seeping into those local populations because Russia has a clear advantage in the media sphere. I mean, it's Hollywood on steroids. You cannot compete with it. Even Hollywood is like your basic cable television compared to what Russia is producing. And they really fold propaganda into it very well in all their entertainment shows. I mean, if you go on Amazon and download some current historical dramas, they're fantastic. And if you listen closely, you will hear the propaganda coming out in it. Um, it's, it's, it's quite scary. So what they're doing in countries, for example, you know, I just came from Moldova, is even the local Romanian-speaking population, which is the majority, is taken hostage by this complete blaring of Russian propaganda every single day, and they'll blare it and they'll dub it into Romanian. Um, so they're picking up all these kind of fake news about what's really going on. Um, the polling numbers when I left there this summer, it was creeping more towards uh, 51, 52% for uh, Eurasian Union membership versus EU membership that creeps up a little bit more each year. Uh, so we're missing opportunities here because now it's expanding. It's expanding. It's not just the, Russian, the, the minority ethnic Russians in these periphery countries. It's seeping into the local populations and as well as through the Orthodox Church. The main Orthodox Church in Moldova remains the Russian or, or, uh, patriarch, not the Romanian one. So these people are going to church on Sundays and receiving their political information as well. So I would respectfully disagree of just kind of letting it implode in, on itself, but also ask you how can we work better across the USG to address these gaps? I worked in Moldova for five years on you know, countering Russian propaganda campaigns. We put a lot of aid money into it, um, but I would argue we could put way more into it if we had the resources. And as you know, our resources are declining. So I would love to hear your thoughts either today or if you go back and think about it and want to email me later on how we can come together as a USG to really tackle these windows of opportunity now together. Thank you, Stephanie. Did you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Stephanie from Bradford in the USA chair. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Other questions or comments? Yes, uh, Mr. Wilcox, please. Thanks. Um, You're ready for the answer. Great. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you paid me to come up here. I'm getting paid, right? <laughs> okay. No, I, I, and, and I, if I communicated the fact that just sit back passively and let it happen, that's not certainly what I meant. And that's never what Kennan actually advocated no. either in his part. It was, but it was a matter of Vigilant picking and choosing, not, not everywhere. And of course, that kind of became the criticism of, of the Truman Doctrine and the follow-on the German doctor basically said, well, we're not setting any bounds. We're just going to make it wide open where, where Cannon would have advised be careful. And, and I agree with you. There's, there's got to be some pushing. And, but, and I think in terms of, the, of working across the government, some decisions have to be made. Where, are we going to, where, where should our resources be go? Which instrument of power should we favor in certain areas? Um, it, it would seem that a lot of weight is going. In fact, almost the military almost becomes a default in many areas. And, and maybe some thought needs to be given to, to moving in a bit different direction there and, and being more, more selective is when do we use military instrument power? What is it we want to achieve with the military instrument power? And can we get more, more bang for the buck or rubble for the ruble, if you will, by using some other instrument power in specific cases in, in situations like Moldova and perhaps elsewhere? Could, could I say something just for a moment yes, also? Yeah, you know, I, I should perhaps have said something about that because of course, Propaganda is part of the asymmetric strategy for dealing with a world which is so much more powerful than Russia. I mean, we have it here, we have it in Europe. I mean, Moldova is part of Europe. We have it in like Brexit, we have it in France, we have it in Germany, we have it all over the place. So yes, and uh, our our own uh, former radio, Liberty Radio Free Europe, is you know tiny and you know lost in space. Uh, we could be doing a lot more of that and a lot, lot better. Um, it, it's also, I think, possibly important to differentiate among the different countries in the near abroad because 
the, uh, the Belarus, Moldova, maybe partly Ukraine story, I think is a little bit different from the, from the former Stan stories, uh, where you've got this kind of disconnect as an older generation that did know Russian is you know, heading towards retirement and the people who are coming from those places as migrant laborers to Russia aren't leaving with a whole lot of warm and cuddly feelings when they go back to there. So it, it, it's a work in progress, but I take your point and I totally agree with what you said. Anybody else the panel? Thank you very much for a great question and great answers. Other questions, comments, sir, please? Please introduce yourself that everybody knows who is asking a question. Nisala Rodrigo, I'm a student at SAMS. I have a question for the entire panel. You, 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 you talked about these individual countries in Eurasia, but I'm, I'm very curious to see about their, their perceptions of each other and uh, how you'll see them interacting with each other in the next 10 years, 10, 15 years. Anybody to begin with? I'll, I'll, Mr. Hicks? I'll start and turn pass the baton again. Um, I think as, as uh, Jeff mentioned in his, his presentation, you know, Turkey and Iran cooperate, but see each other as strategic competitors uh, for influence in the region. Um, and there are certainly important uh, economic ties uh, between, between, the two, between the two as well. Um, Iran, Russia, has undergone a rather dramatic, their relationship has undergone a rather dramatic transformation, uh, especially since uh, 2015, uh, where they partnered in Syria uh, to bolster the Assad regime. Uh, and I think that took uh, many people by surprise, the fact that Russia put, ground, uh, put forces into, into the fight in Syria uh, in support of the pro-regime uh, pro forces, which certainly um, is, was, is, was and continues to be a shared interest of the, uh, of the Islamic Republic uh, and, and a key enabler um, to the Assad regime solidifying uh, you know, more control than they had back in 2015 uh, of the country, certainly. Um, and what was the, the second part of your question is uh, over the next 10 to 15 years, well, for Iran, as I was talking about their strategic culture, they, you know, they have this victimhood mentality of being trampled on uh, by foreign powers, right? And Russia is part of that. Russia has occupied, they, they fought, uh, Russia and Iran fought a couple wars, uh, during which Iran lost uh, a lot of territory uh, to the Russians. Uh, Russia occupied Iran northern Iran uh, during both World War I uh, as well as World War II. So there's certainly some uh, Iranian uh, sensitivities. There's, there's baggage there, right? So certainly uh, on the short-term, near-term interest in Syria, uh, there, Iran is definitely happy to work with, with Russia towards that, that, that shared interest. Uh, but there is historical baggage uh, out there um, that, that should, be, uh, should be considered. It's really hard to project that many that far uh, into the future, um, but uh, given the past, say since the Islamic Revolution, anyway, and even going uh, even before that, uh, I think it's fair to say that Turkey and Iran will always be kind of jostling uh, to gain an advantageous position or, over the other, uh, and uh, Iran will work with Russia, uh, but will always perhaps be a little leery of ultimate Russian uh, intentions vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the Middle East. But let me, uh, let me pass the baton to my colleagues. Anybody else? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So from a Turkish perspective, uh, first off, Erdogan's just been elected for another five years. So, so watch as Erdogan goes, so will the country of Turkey goes. I mean, you know, all the organs of state are now funneled and channeled through him. Uh, but at the same time, I think Erdogan very clearly understands that there is a fight for influence within the Sunni Islamic world, and that, that, that the Iranians have interjected themselves into that fight. Uh, so, so, so they see a threat there and a challenge, and, and they will rise to meet it. Uh, certainly, uh, the, the, the Turks have, have, have worked to take those organs of, of uh, public diplomacy, of influence and stuff, and, 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 and centralize them. Uh, 
so you have much more of a, a kind of a reversion to uh, uh, you know state-run newspapers as opposed to you know privately run or, or you know you know you get all all versions of the of the spectrum. You don't have that so much anymore. Uh, but uh, Turkey, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there weren't television stations. You know, aside from about three of them, and two of those were you know Western. Uh, now they've got this very dynamic. Uh, you know, television industry, and, and uh, they have a lot of influence. And where they have influence is across the Turkish stands, okay? So, so you know, the fall of the Soviet Union, and suddenly there's this opening for influence from Turkey into Azerbaijan, into Turkmenistan, and, and the others, and, and they want to retain that, and, and they will work to retain that. And Erdogan understands specifically, uh, make no mistake about it, he is a, he is a, a Turkish patriot every bit as much as, as Mustafa Kemal was. Uh, but he has a different view of the, th of the world, and you go back to, you know, what I said. You know, he knows what is best for Turkey. You know, he's right, you're wrong, and, and he is not apologetic in the least about it. Uh, his only, his real weakness is Russia, because they are very susceptible to Russian economic influence and pressure. Uh, so he's, he's you know, with the whole Syria thing, he's got himself stuck on a bit of uh, Putin sticky flypaper. Uh, we'll see how that pans out, but but at the same time, I think they very clearly understand that that uh, at least as far as it goes south, uh, the ability to control the message in 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 the Sunni Islam world, and that includes with the Arab countries, uh, that's that's what's up for grabs right now. So you have ISIS, you have Al Qaeda, you have these other groups, you have the recent Arab Spring, uh, a lot of turmoil. And, and, and Turkey is very, very concerned about that in the person of, of Erdogan. So does that help? Uh, yes. Okay. I'll talk about just, Russia's got a lot of neighbors. Let me just talk about two of them, um, Japan and China. Okay. So um, as you know, uh, it's, it's a little bit after 1945 now, isn't it? It's like, like 73 years or something. There's no, uh, who, but who's counting among friends? Um, there's no peace treaty yet between uh, Tokyo and Moscow, as you know, because they've got this tiny little problem of the northern islands and the territory that uh, Moscow, just for whatever reason, has never given back. Um, there's talk right now that uh, there may finally be a peace treaty between Japan and uh, Russian Federation. But for that to happen, I'm pretty sure that uh, the Kremlin's going to have to give back uh, this territory. It's not much territory, it's just like oh, rocks, uh, which begs the question, how come they haven't done this already? How come they haven't done it under uh, any of the Soviet leadership or now? Um, I have a guess, but I don't know if it's the right guess. It's that if you, once you start giving, in a Kremlin view, once you start giving territory back, where do you stop? Uh, so we'll see. Um, with China, it's kind of an interesting situation. and There are many different dimensions we could look at towards the future. If you look towards the past, there was a great big powerful red army and uh, Soviet economy and a little uh, populous but little struggling PLA and a Chinese economy. The situation is totally reversed now and there's this like very diffuse province, kind of like at the outskirts of the Chinese Empire. They call it the Russian Federation for now. Um, so what's going to happen to the Russian Far East as we look towards the future? This is, this is something I've talked about with Russian demographers. I mean, the Russian Far East isn't exactly a demographic vacuum because it's more populated, you know, per square kilometer than Antarctica, and it's more populated per square kilometer than the Sahara Desert, but it's not more populated per square kilometer than, say, Mongolia. Uh, and it's next to a very big uh, growing economy with a lot of people in it. Uh, probably the best, I think one of the best uh, demographers in Russia is a guy named Anatoly Vishnevsky, uh, who runs the demography department at the Higher School of Economics. And I asked him, I said, uh, what do you think is going to happen to the Russian Far East over time? And he said, well, over time, I don't think it's going to be Russian. Uh, we're not going to like that, but you're not going to like it either. For, you know, for your consideration. Thank you, Dr. Eberstein. Good. And just, just kind of one final thought when we talk about Russia, China, Turkey, and that dynamic between those three countries. Syria, it just jumps right to mind. Oh, my gosh. 
The other place I suggest looking at is the South Caucasus region, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, where all three countries have, have interests, and all three former empires bumped up against one, each, one, one another. Um, so, yeah, watch that and see what, see what happens there. That might give you another indicator for the next 10 to 15 years. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. I appreciate the answers. Okay. Is that answers your question, sir? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. There was a question in the back. Yes, Dr. Bauman. Yeah, it's, it's live. I'm Bob Bauman. I uh, run the master's degree program here, but I'm uh, a Russia-Eurasia guy in my spare time. Uh, it's been my long time focus. Uh, starting uh, with perspective of somebody who spent a large chunk of the last couple of years in Uzbekistan and kind of following upon uh, Stephanie's observations, uh, Russia still projects a surprising level of uh, what we might call soft power uh, beyond its borders. And a lot of this has to do with language, uh, which brings us around to the question of, uh, of demographics. Uh, so uh, I have a question, but I want to frame it with just a, a couple of observations uh, initially. Um, we're, we're seeing the demographic struggles play out within Russia in a number of ways. One of them is the recent controversy over uh, pension reform. Uh, which clearly relates to, uh, relates to demographics. Uh, Putin is trying to reduce pension costs by raising the pension age, uh, which is a, uh, a hot item, but one that will have real uh, economic impact. Um, in terms of the constituent demographics of uh, the Russian Federation, uh, a substantial chunk, perhaps a quarter, is not Russian. Uh, they are difficult to generalize about uh, because many still strongly identify as Russians. In fact, one of the most eager, active uh, Russian, uh, Russian history reenactors and uh, Russian history proponents in the uh, sort of the Putin school that I know is not Russian. Um, so there's clearly influence there, but the demographic trends, of course, suggest the non-Russian population is growing faster and there could be some uh, centrifugal effect there. Um, uh, speaking of which, regionalism has also uh, blossomed in Russia. So some places where, even where you have Russians, uh, they're not necessarily sharing the viewpoint uh, from uh, from Moscow. My question really focuses on uh, on language. It, it, to some degree, it seems to me there's a there's a race going on. Russia is still eager to project its influence using Russia, particularly in the post-Soviet spaces. Uh, but Russian is not growing as a language used internationally, if, and even in the post-Soviet space, it's shrinking. The main intrusive competitor happens to be English. Uh, and Uzbekistan, uh, one of the, maybe the fastest growing business niche that I observed uh, was English language teaching. Uh, so uh, how do you see this playing out in terms of uh, uh, Russia's role in the, the Eurasian space, uh, in terms of its influence, and, uh, and so forth? Thank you. Anybody to begin with? I'll, I'll, Mr. Wilcox? I'll kind of warm you up for the real authority here who's going to give the right answer. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, Bob, that you, that, that you had mentioned that because I remember when I was in Uzbekistan in 2003, I went to the Ministry of Defense and I started babbling in Russian to the young soldier at the gate and realized he had no clue what I was, anything I was saying. The language was totally alien to him. So, I mean, it, it, that is a really good point. And I think part of it may tie back to how much traction is this Ruski Mir going to have? Is eventually it's going to be Ruski Mir, but that's not the language we want, and is it going to lose more and more influence that way? So I think, I think that's a key, a key point there. Um, and I'll pass the baton to my colleague now. Dr. Eberson. Mm -hmm. I don't have the hard demographic numbers that I should for this, um, because this is something that this is something that Yandex and Google and Yahoo will have a lot of proprietary big data about that would be very useful to uh, know, might even get shared. But it's clearly true that since the, as a generalization, that since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the Ruski Mir or the, uh, the Russian language culture world has shrunk a lot there are different articles I've read uh, from Russian sources that talk about the spiraling decline of uh, study of Russian and the near abroad and stuff. 
I, I can't verify any of that. I mean, but what we have seen, and it's not just a matter of the, uh, of the uh, end of the Cold War, is just how English language during our lifetimes have come so totally to rule everywhere, anywhere you travel. Uh, it's, it's an absolute astonishing thing. We don't think of that as part of our soft power usually, but it really is. Thank you so much. Uh, is that answers your question, Dr. Bauman? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kim, please. I found your discussion of the demographics fascinating about the declining populations in Russia. I wonder if, if it's the opposite trend, as I understand, in Iran and somewhere in between in Turkey. Yeah, so much has been um, discussed over the many years about Iran's um, youth bulge and the impact it was having on, um, on the adherence of Iranian youth to the ideals of the Islamic Revolution, as I commented about um, briefly. I do have some um, open source figures. I anticipated this question was going to come up. So the uh, ages 15 through, and I apologize for not having a graphic on it because it lends itself to an excellent graphic um, like uh, Dr. Nick had. But the uh, segment of Iran's youth population, which Iran defines as ages 15 through 29, is now just 25 percent of the population. That's down from 35 percent of the population uh, uh, just uh, 10 years ago. Um, so Iran's population is fine. Oh, and also uh, the median age uh, is now 30, uh, whereas it was just 27 uh, in 2011. Um, and the fertility rate's now under 2.2 two as well. It's at 1.9. These are official Iranian um, government statistics. So uh, the population is finally aging after the big youth bulge uh, post-Islamic revolution, uh, where we did see an increase in um, the size of the middle class in Iran uh, after, after the revolution. That was a big part of why there was this big um, youth bulge. So uh, the population is aging, but two-thirds of the population was born you know, after the overthrow of the Shah. So this is the uh, big dilemma uh, for the hardliners in the regime who, who openly talk about uh, the, the, um, the waning of this ideological fervor and their efforts uh, to try to reinvigorate that fervor. They do things uh, like take uh, school children on trips to the uh, Iran-Iraq war battlefields uh, where the, the school children are taught about the heroic sacrifices of the besieges who rushed the front, li the front lines of, of the Iraqis uh, because what, what the Iranians lacked in the way of, of uh, armored equipment uh, and other mo more modern technology to try to overcome uh, superior Iraqi weaponry at the time. And of course the narrative is that the U.S. and the West was arming Saddam Hussein, uh, which really isn't, isn't true. Uh, so, uh, so the demographics um, are an important factor in how the strategic culture of Iran is and could continue uh, to evolve. But the hardliners are doing all they can to try to ensure that it doesn't evolve in ways that are harmful to the, to the old guard. Does that, does that answer your question, sir? As far as Turkey goes, mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't anticipate this question, uh, but there's nothing excruciatingly remarkable about what's going on within Turkey now. You know, with the urbanization, I, I think the trend is is kind of to more more towards that 2.3 kids per family type type thing, and so you've got a more stable base, so to speak. Uh, I don't think the growth rate is uh, probably about on par with Iran, maybe a little bit lower even, uh, but but uh, uh, certainly nothing that that is. Uh, uh, you know, intending or, or uh, portends, you know, you, you're going to have this great youth bulge. Uh, it's just, uh, I, th I think with, with the industrialization, the education over the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years, th that you have a much more professional class and, and a much more urbanized uh, populace. So, anybody else? Dr. Anderson? Uh, just to both, both Iran and 
Turkey are places I've done a little bit of demographic homework on, and just for the heck of it, I'll share some of that with you. Awesome. Uh, so the fact, to me, the fascinating thing about Iran is how low its birth rate is. It's uh, about, if, if you believe their census numbers, they're kind of like China. They're about 25 plus percent below what they'd need now for long-term replacement. And if you uh, look at a place like Tehran, its birth level is about the same as uh, Zurich. I mean, it's a very uh, German low birth level. And this is kind of interesting to me for one reason. Uh, there's, I don't know any population around the world that's got a seriously below replacement birth rate where there's really devout religiosity. I think of a below uh, replacement birth rate as a sign of secularism. And, uh, you know, I mean, an Islamic uh, clerisy can make people uh, pump their fists in the street. They can make people chant death to America, but they can't make them have babies. And this is, not I think, yet, anyway. not yet, at least they haven't figured that out. But, but I think this may be a sign of uh, a disconnect. I, I can't prove this, but I think this may be a sign of disconnect between uh, elite decision makers and popular sentiment there. With, Turkey, I, I went to Turkey about five years ago to do a demographic homework um, uh, assignment for our government because if you look at uh, Turkish statistical sources, there's no breakout for the Kurdish population. And um, uh, actually, the Kurds don't show up in uh, Iranian statistics, they don't show up in Syrian statistics, they don't show up in Iraqi statistics or in Turkish, so it's, you know, yeah. all in the family. Um, so I had to try to go in through the back door, kind of. So I, I talked with people who do demographic and health surveys because they do stuff on mother tongue. I talked with people who like tried to sell diapers and Mercedes Benzes to people who spoke Kurdish and stuff. You know, so it wasn't exactly, it wasn't, it wasn't the best demography, but it's maybe good enough for government work. Um, what it seemed to show was a huge disconnect between the population, the, the patterns for the Turkish speaking people and for the Kurdish speaking people. So if you went to a place like Ankara, Ankara has a, Ankara has a birth rate that's about the same as Copenhagen these days, right? It's like 1.6, 1.5. But then if you go out to Orfa or Shanli Orfa, you know, out on the other side and kind of um, what I suppose we're not supposed to call uh, Kurdistan, um, three, three and a half uh, births per woman. On the basis of this, it looked to me as if all of the labor growth in the next generation in Turkey is going to be Kurdish-speaking people. And the po all of the population growth after a little bit of a while will be Kurdish-speaking people. And the reconfiguration of the country will be about a third of the labor force being from Kurdish, uh, originally ethnic Kurdish background. Now, of course, that can all be dealt with, but it, mean, it, it makes for some differences from where we are today. And as long as the government doesn't collect numbers on it, uh, the possibility that they'll be blindsided by this is a little bit higher. Thank you, Dr. Eberstadt. Yes, Dr. Kemp. I would think that some of the population growth in Turkey is also, though, highly attributable to the uh, increased nutrition and increased health care, which is dramatic from the other oh, yes. two countries. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But, it, but, it, but everybody gets to live longer, and as, as the health differentials uh, reduce, that's even more for the Kurdish side. Dr. Kim? answers your question. Uh, sir, in the back. Yes, sir. My name is Kamal Ayub, and I am a student at uh, uh, in the college over here. And I'm from USAID. I have uh, some comments and two questions about Iran and Turkey. About Iran, um, Whatever was uh, said about Iran, yeah, that is uh, generally in the Islamic belief, and uh, it is whether it is Shia or Sunni, they believe that uh, way on martyrdom and all that. My question is that 
I think we were negotiating very successfully with Iran, and Iran even agreed to come on the table, and they signed some treaty about limiting on the nuclear weapons and all that. And then uh, USA decided unilaterally to to just uh, trash that treaty and not, no more no more negotiate with Iran. I think sometimes this when this happens, it the trust is lost and sometimes USA is pushed into these kind of actions because we are an ally of uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel and sometimes those countries don't want the United States to go that close to Iran. I think if we start negotiating with Iran, a lot of problems in the Middle East can be resolved because as you said, Iran has a lot of influence over over Shias in, in spread out all over the Middle East, and those, if we are on the negotiating ses successfully with Iran, we can at least lower those problems to some extent in Syria or maybe uh, in uh, Iraq and maybe even in Saudi Arabia where there is a sizable amount of uh, Shia minority over there. And number two about Turkey, I think if few years back, it, it, Turkey was trying to desperately go back into European Union, and it was trying its best to be acceptable, uh, to become an acceptable member of, uh, of for EU. But for some reason, uh, European Union didn't want uh, Turkey to be the member because it has a huge number of population, and moreover, it will outnumber uh, so many other European countries, and maybe there is a large Muslim population in uh, uh, Turkey also, which which might influence the the demographics of European Union. Uh, now, from what maybe my historical knowledge is a little poor, but from what I understand, there will be some territories which will go back to Turkey, like Bosphorus and even Mosul, because there was some treaty after World War I, which took place, so that will make Turkey maybe a little bit more powerful. So um, my question would be that how would we deal with Turkey if it gains those territories and becomes a little bit more powerful? Uh, I think Erdogan will have a little more uh, leverage in, in that part of the world. So yeah. can you repeat your question one more time? Just more, more louder. Can you speak louder? Okay, about Iran or Turkey? Yeah, the last, qu the, the, so far was a comment, right? The last was the question. Yeah, the, my question was about Turkey was that if, if, if Turkey gets back those territories which were a part of the treaty and they, were, they went back like Bosphorus and Mosul uh, to, uh, to different countries, if though if we, Turkey gets those territories back, would that make uh, uh, Turkey a little bit more uh, powerful in that way? So uh, first off, that's not going to happen because this is this is clearly established history, and, and uh, uh, you know we've been we've been stroking that for uh, for a while now. But the issue becomes uh, these are comments that that Erdogan has made publicly, and 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 these are. Uh, perhaps a hint at what he may want, but he knows realistically it's not going to happen. However, it feeds his domestic base. This is, this is the method. When he makes these comments about, you know, you know these, these treaties were unfair to us, you know, the, the, these, uh, you know, Lausanne or, or Sev or anything like that, uh, uh, this goes back to a, a domestic uh, messaging piece uh, for him. Uh, he understands very clearly uh, that, that there are certain issues that in terms of the EU, He's probably not going to advance his agenda. However, he is not going to totally trash that agenda as well, because he continues and continue. He needs he needs the Europe's Europeans. He needs to have that that lash up economically. He's right now in Germany. He's got a three day state visit uh, with uh, Angela Merkel. And, and and why is he there in Germany? Because his economy is tanking. The lira has lost quite a bit of value. He's been forced to do things with the with the national bank that he did not want to do, which was raise the rates, and uh, so so uh, he is under pressure at home. And the only way to change change that 
is to continue to get good graces from his European counterparts. Oh, by the way, there's about three million Turkish expatriates living in beautiful downtown Germany. And so, so he's, he's playing the long game in that regard. Uh, so, so uh, you know, whether he's pandering to his base or, or playing, again, the pragmatic role, um, I, I, Turkey has never had an expansionist uh, foreign policy. They've never been somebody that said, hey, we're going to go ahead and, and, and come in and go after this. Uh, and I don't, I just, I've, I've never encouraged or in, encountered that when I've been there. And I don't think realistically er Erdogan wants that either because that will buy him more problems than it will solve. So, so uh, I, just, I just don't think that, uh, that that's going to be a player. So again, it's, it's, that, it's that idea of, of messaging from, an Erdogan's, from Erdogan's perspective. Anybody else? So. Is that answers your question, sir? Well, okay. I, I think I know the question. Uh, so I think your question is on the wisdom of negotiating with the Islamic Republic. So, right. look, I, I'm, a, I'm an intelligence professional, and so I'm not here to comment. Uh, on U.S. policy, uh, it's obviously uh, it, it's obvious that the the previous U.S. administration and the current U.S. administration have two very um, stark uh, perspectives um, on on uh, making deals with Iran. Right? I mean that that part's obvious. As an intelligence professional, me and my colleagues are there to help advise the policymakers, no matter you know, whose, whose administration is in power um, uh, to advise them of risks as well as opportunities and what we think Iran's strategy is uh, going forward. And sorry, that's all I can really comment on that. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself, ask your question, or make a comment. Yeah, my name is Daryl Warden with Tradoc G2. Uh, first, thank you all. We're very informative. So I've got first, I've got a, a statement just for general awareness of this audience, and then I'll get to my question. Um, I saw a briefing the other day uh, coming out of the J7 about the joint operational environment. Uh, it's an unclassified document. It takes a look in the future. Uh, they're revising that. Uh, so I don't know when that's going to come out. But one of the things that struck me was this whole of uh, whole of nation approach. Uh, which I think is going to go into greater granularity and cover many things that you've addressed here uh, versus the nature of conflict, which is in the current Joe to 2035. So I just bring that out for your attention. I would look for that. I think it's a great unclassified document that talks about the strategic OE. Now, now I'm going to get to my question. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer that demographics do matter. Uh, so when I, when I took a look at the slide up there that talked about the medium age and the rise, uh, declining populations, death rates falling, do you see a diaspora in Russia uh, to make up for a, a working class mm -hmm. labor force? Let's go out to say 2040 that shows that big decline. Do you see a point where the diaspora of people coming in to make up that void could potentially change the political identity of a country? That's a great question, Dr. Berson. That's a wonderful question. Um, I, did a, uh, I did a book a few years ago called Russia's Peacetime Demographic Crisis. And I tried to estimate how many people had come into Russia uh, between the end of the Soviet era and like the 2010 uh, census. Looks like, um, looks like there were almost enough to make up for about half of the birth versus death survey. They, they made up, there was a, a, almost a 14 million gap between births and deaths and in migration made up about half of that difference. Not enough to keep things from going down. Uh, very new and different patterns would be needed for the future. Now, you know, we get to an apples versus oranges problem. Uh, there are Russians in the near abroad who haven't wanted to move to the Russian Federation 
and it's not clear at this point that anything short of tumult and catastrophe in those countries would uproot them and make them want to go back to the Russian Federation or somewhere else. If that's the case, the people who would be coming in, as you intimated, would be of non-Russian ethnicities. What's happened so far is that mainly you've had a brain drain of skilled people leaving Russia and going to you know, Europe, America, Israel, wherever, and you're having uh, less skilled uh, and increasingly non-Russian speaking people come from Central Asia and elsewhere. Now, I don't see anything like a tipping point in that over the time period that we're looking at. If you, you know, if you're like Auguste Comte and demography is destiny, you're looking like out a thousand years, and you know, and there's all sorts of replacement of population across the Eurasian expanse. But in the next ten or twenty years, what you might see, I think, would be people who will be more difficult to integrate and assimilate in Russia, and that might make for some cohesion problems and maybe also for some nationalist reaction to this. I mean, you watch this. I mean, what, what do you think, Mark? I mean, is that, does that track with what you see? It does, because you see, I mean, you, you see some reaction, small things to, to Central Asians that are coming in, but nothing, nothing that's huge that's going on. Um, I guess you could even, I don't know if you could model off of how, how the Caucasians are treated in, in Russia periodically. They're, they're identified as a problem. They get right. dealt with, but they still, it still hasn't led to a large change within the country. Okay. If that answers your question, sir. Great question, great answers. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, sir. The mic is right there. Mm -hmm. It's getting more and more fascinating, isn't it? Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Major Dan Lang, and CGSC student. Um, for the Russia panelists, so, so given what we know about Vladimir Putin and the negative demographic uh, trends going on, do you assess that makes Russian foreign policy less or more dangerous to U.S. interests over time? Uh, that is to say, do you, do you think Putin will start to resort to tactics of desperation as he realizes his growing problem? Mr. Wilcox. Give it a and I'll give it a crack. I, 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 I'm not sure that I can envision circumstances when he might resort to desperation. It would have to be some absolute threat to the regime and, and those who are in power. Um, and I'm not sure that demograph demography would be it. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that right now. So he... Um in, in 2001, in one of his very first uh, addresses to the un uh, State of the Union addresses, um, he identified demography as uh, national security threat number one. Um, I believe that the people in the Kremlin would credit themselves with having brought down death rates and brought up birth rates so that they're kind of stable now and they'd see that as something they'd take credit for. I'm not sure they should because, as I said, I think this is just a temporary balance and things are going to head back down that way. Um, if you were the man from Mars and you were just like looking at behavior, you might see that during this period in which Russia's demographic power, if we can use that, I, I, it's not very precise, but I think you know what I mean, is kind of on the wane in comparison to what's going on in the rest of the world. We see this demographic power in relation to other countries kind of decreasing, and Russia as becoming an actor that's increasingly tolerant of taking risks internationally. Um, I can see how those two things kind of like can be explained together, but I just don't see how they can go on in these different directions forever. Anybody else? Is that answers your question, sir? Good, thank you. Okay, this is a, I just wanted to mention, this is a good crowd for late Friday, isn't it? Usually we have standing rooms only, but still, I mean, I'm impressed. 
And I'm getting more and more passionate as we discuss all these important issues. I'm, I'm very passionate. So any questions, answer, I mean uh, comments from the audience. And outstations, you can chime in at any time. You are welcome to join us at any time. Questions, comments, anybody? Sir, it's me again, MC, Global New Generation Director. Hey, yes, sir. Just a comment, I would like to offer a comment to the panel and the audience. Uh, economics drive demographics, as we all know. And in Russia, again, I'll put some caution into assessments of how diverse that effect is going to be. Uh, economical impacts uh, definitely drive that. My point is this, we live in the most connected uh, society in the modern world. And what our adversaries, the Chinese, Russians, and state non state actors have identified as a tool to manage any problem sets is pretty much something not new, but exists in the past and today. It's COFM, Correlation of Forces, Examining the Force and Method of Action. They apply that in the information warfare arena. And there were a few questions there. I would like to add that as a solution. The solution is this, that we cannot longer look at individual perimeters into a, assessing a country's possibility for success and not success in the economical, social, or military. We need to look at it holistically and globally as impacts from that relationship, example, Russia, China, Iran, or into Eurasia with uh, one major driving force right now, which is the Belt Road Initiative by China. And if we look at that, that impact of demographics, economic privileges or not privileges by the Russia, the Chinese present to the world. So I'll leave it at that. I want to say thank you and I appreciate your uh, time. Thank you, sir. Anybody to respond or? No. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we're getting closer to the end. I know you still have tons of questions, right? And including the outstations. Sir, please, anytime. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Jordan Ewers. I'm a DJMO instructor here at the college, uh, strategic intelligence officer, and I'm also uh, sitting on a committee for an MMAS student who's studying Russia and various threats. And uh, So my question is that, uh, in what ways do you foresee the Russian national military strategy, if you will, evolving over the next few years? Specifically, I would be interested in your opinions as to which types of military operations the Russian military is likely to see as more advantageous or desirable given the challenges that they face pertaining to their national military industrial complex or perhaps um, just basically in which ways they think they might be able to uh, gain influence or, or advance their, their interests. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sounds like something. Anybody to begin with? <laughs> Mark? Okay. Uh, for, first of all, I can't believe your student has not approached either Greg Cook or me to be on the committee, but that's okay. We'll, we'll let that go. Um, I think the, the f first thing to, to kind of address is uh, certainly the Russians have building, been building up significant military capability. They're investing a lot in, in conventional forces. They're investing a lot in nuclear forces as well. Um, and they are in, in, in so, and, and they're, you see they're starting to tailor and, and realize limitations as well. A good example is the Navy. Instead of starting to build large, large Navy ships, they're realizing we need a lot more smaller ships. So their, their expectations, I think, are getting a bit more realistic on what they can actually do, which gets down to, I think, maybe the difference between do we see them doing perhaps more power projection or do we see them more on defending assets to defend the country and potentially intervene in, in the so-called near abroad? Uh, if we look at recent exercises, like the one that just took place out in the Eastern Military Vostok. District, the Vostok 2018 military exercise, um, certainly billed and hawked by the Russians as this massive exercise, 300,000 Russian forces. Oh my gosh, all these Chinese. Okay, it was only 3,200. But there were Chinese there as well. Um, large force-on-force, force, multi-division force-on-force force exercises, two fleets doing force-on-force force with each other in the Pacific. So they're, they're certainly conveying, they're, they're doing a lot of information and publicity. They're, they're conveying strength quite a bit, which is quite consistent with the current defense minister, Mr. Shoigu, who is, who is his name is spelled like show, and it's appropriate because he's a real showman and he really does like to, to show off himself and his capabilities. 
But I think if you look at, aside from, if we look at their quote unquote power projection, you know, they, they make a lot about, wow, look what we did in Syria. Well, Syria is not that far away, really. That's, that's, that's projection, it's important, and it's nice that you fired cruise missiles from the Caspian Sea and they went and hit targets in Syria. They've demonstrated a lot of regional capability, and, and I think that's what the, where they're really going to retain their capability. Um, yes, they fly a bear bomber periodically. They, they came to Alaska, by Alaska not too long ago, and they'll sortie a ship down once in a while. They'll drag the aircraft carrier, the Northern Fleet. It'll chug its way into the mid. It'll chug its way back to the Northern Fleet for three to four more years of servicing. But I, I think they're going to remain a, 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 a regional power. If you look at a lot of what their military strategy, it's really, it boils down to defending. It's kind of like continental defense. That's what they're designed to do, and the way they exercise is can we move forces back and forth within the Russian Federation. Um, now, the other place where they might get perhaps a little frisky is the Arctic. That's sort of a, a kind of terra incognita. I guess I shouldn't say terra incognita. It should be mare incognita because it's becoming more and more water and less, <laughs> less solid stuff now. That might be some place where we might see the Russians perhaps demonstrating more, because they, they see opportunities up there and they, they regard a lot of that as, as their water and, and their place as well. And they're, they're certainly trying to develop capabilities up there as well. Um, so somewhat incomprehensive, incomprehensible what I just said, a little stream of consciousness there. But I, I think, I, 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 don't, I don't see them lashing out unless they feel that they're, they're really starting to lose influence somewhere again. That's, yeah, I'll close with that. Anything else, Dr. Eberstadt? So as, as another Eurasia expert in support of this great, great team, I would like just to add, as a moderator, I think I, I can do that, right? So there are two factors in terms of you know, what Russia is doing in developing military capabilities. Talking about the incentive, right? So if you read those doctrinal documents uh, of the Russian Federation, such as uh, updated military strategy and Russian national security strategy, publications by Valery Gerasimov in the military industrial career, who is the uh, chief of the general staff of the Russian armed forces. So you can clearly see that uh, NATO's expansion is a sensitive question for, uh, for Russia, kind of in reply to that they're trying to m move forward as well in terms of the military capabilities. I can give you examples like uh, deploying S-300 to Kaliningrad Oblast in response to deployment or a de a deployment uh, of the so-called anti-missile program led by the U.S. in Red Zikovo uh, site in Poland, which is a NATO member now. Okay, so uh, that's one question. The second question is um, several major regional and global countries, I would call like that, they see per, uh, perceived threat from the U.S. And, and the West. As a result, it's pushing them together. The BRICS organization is an example. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, which, uh, and they established a mutual fund. Um, so it's equated to potentially NATO, or Eurasian Customs Union, which equated to World Bank and you know, the International Monetary Fund, potentially. So um, these kinds of, and then it has direct relevance to the Russian strategic culture based on the Great Patriotic War, losing 27 million uh, people, Napoleon invasion, blah, blah, blah. And there are certain uh, ideologies emerged of the so-called uh, Eurasianism, which reflects that strategic culture. The Alexander Dugin is one of them. Several years ago, there was a perception that Putin is following his, this ideology, but I think he kind of got away uh, clearly from that uh, uh, kind of uh, idea. Um, so that's kind of adding to what was said by my great team. Uh, any other questions? Hey, sir. sir. This is me again. Are the outstations? I would like to. Yes, it's yes, me sir. again. I would like to offer an answer, a military answer to the question. So, number one, indicators from the Russian state armament program and indicators from numerous exercises that conventional forces have significantly increased the level of complexity capabilities. 
through being able to operate in a multi-domain operation and cross-domain maneuver through operations and, uh, and actually implying all the fundamentals of this concept for us. Secondly, in the nuclear triad uh, portfolio of the Russian Federation have been significantly improved by digitalizing and improving the multiple uh, moving platforms as far as uh, missile systems, and I'll leave it at that. And last but not least, is they uh, provide opportunity for the adversaries uh, to think conventional. The one thing is uh, clearly a warning and indicator from them is the one-off capability. Due to the classification of this briefing, I only keep it to one example. You can find open source is the glider. So if we see the Russian military top process, again, Kofum is number one. And number two is ability for them to reach within the corner of the United States, whatever and however they would like to do so, what a capability that exists today. So the complexity of the question you presented is that much uh, more uh, elaborate, elaborate answer that I don't have time for. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your comment. I appreciate your time and very active involvement in today's discussion. That was really great. Any questions, comments from the audience or outstations? I'm surprised. That never happens. So, excellent. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I was sure something was going to come up. All right. Hi, Please I'm Amanda introduce Carlin. Yeah. Um, I'm a student at SAMS and a DIA analyst. I was just going to ask, we've talked a little bit about uh, China-Russia dynamics, but I'm curious about how Iran and Turkey have adjusted their strategies based on Chinese interactions and engagements. Can you, can you say the last part of that on Chinese? Engagement. Engagement. Okay. Engagement, yeah. Why don't you go ahead, Jeff, and start. Yeah, I, I mean, from the, from the Turkish perspective, and, and this is how I've seen them play it out over the decades, is they're very opportunistic in, in terms of how they, they uh, get into their foreign relationships. And, and uh, part of the issue becomes that reaching to the east, so to speak, with the other Turkic countries, you know, the closer you get, you know, the closer you get to China as well. And so there's some... Uh, small level of influence that's gained there. But, but overall, I don't think the Turks have, uh, have really realistically gone after China as, as, a, as a major partner because they have so many Western interests. And of course, quite a bit of their, their, uh, their capital comes from uh, you know, their, their role as a uh, uh, spaghetti junction, as I like to call it. You know, they, they have so many pipelines that go th you know, to and through Turkey. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of where they make their mark, so to speak. Uh, so uh, if, if there's anything in terms of, you know, arm sales or something like that, it, it's more trying to play one off against the other as opposed to really pursuing actively, in, in my estimation, uh, anything that the Chinese have to offer in that regard. So, so they'll be opportunistic, but I don't, I don't think that they have a real, uh, you know, long-term or, or uh, focused vector in that, in that direction. Anybody else? Is that answers your question, ma'am? <laughs> Can you speak on the mic microphone, please? That's part of it, but I'm also interested in Iran You're Chinese right. dynamics as well in terms of how the hodgepodge of global powers mixes everything Mr. up. Yuka, can you? Yeah, um, there's some open source literature about um, the importance of China to Iran, both diplomatically as well as economically. Mm -hmm. uh, China is a Perm 5 member, of course, of the Security Council. Iran needs all the friends it can get. Um, and so I think um, based on, you know, open source reporting about senior level engagement between Iranian officials, Chinese leadership, uh, you can surmise from that that Iran places a fairly high priority on trying to get China's backing to resist um, uh, U.S. efforts to isolate Iran, um, and that in the political dimension, but especially in the economic dimension. Uh, China is Iran's most important economic partner. Um, again, all open source literature indicates that uh, China buys, uh, is the single largest buyer of Iranian oil, for example. Uh, Iran has been on a diplomatic offensive 
in advance of the four November uh, sanctions, which are about to hit. Um, that will impose secondary, uh, uh, Dr. Nick spoke earlier about the impact of U.S. secondary sanctions. He's ab absolutely correct. Uh, so Iran is trying to secure uh, the continued support of Iranian economic partners, especially and including uh, China in, in that context. Um, and I think uh, hopefully that answers your question. I'll stop there. Ma'am, answers your question? Thank you very much. Great question and great answer. So we're getting closer to the end. I would like, Thank sir, you. yes, please, the last question. I know it never ends. I apologize. Thank you for your interest. Uh, yes, but, absolutely. But she, a thought popped in my head as she asked her question. Uh, Teron Epps, Captain Teron Epps, I'm a student here at CGSOC. Uh, my question is, I, and I, I seen the, I seen some information on the, the, what Russia claims is their largest military exercise and the participation, be it small, with China. So my question is, are, are there any increased or any signs of increased connections between Russia and China economically? Mr. Wilcox or Dr. Ebbs? Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's certainly, the, certainly the energy trade there. Uh, and there's certainly the talk, I mean, you can see indications of that as, as perhaps being in cahoots to assist the North Koreans in getting around some of their sanctions as well. But I mean, at the end of the day, Russia is still a resource provider, and that's kind of it. Resources and weapons is, is what they provide. So the opportunity, I think, to increase trade with China are pretty limited until the Russians can diversify their economy more and provide more more goods that other countries, to include China, would want to have. The, uh, the Russia-China border is conspicuously the least uh, transnational, economically integrated border of any two big, serious economies. I mean, it's conspicuous for what's not happening. Yeah, there is a more potential for Russia-Europe trade economic relationship, and Nord Stream 2 is an, a latest example, which essentially uh, causing the friction among their U.S. allies, because the U.S. is opposing the, the Germany, even Britain and other <coughs> Western countries supporting, particularly Germany, because it's supposed to come to Germany, and Germany will become a, a gas hub, you know, of Europe. So. <coughs> In terms of the China, yes, I completely agree. It's kind of questionable. So more potential in that direction. And, and kind of a, a little small indicator of it, um, back in what's called the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, it's just a region yeah. along the, yeah. the Russia-China border. Sure, sure. uh, They're going to build this bridge to connect Russia and China. The Chinese hurriedly got their half done, and the Russian half still hasn't been built yet. So that may be symbolic of the entire relationship. <laughs> OK. We should stop here if we, everybody would agree, right? Oh, it can continue. Sorry. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Uh, I feel obligated to disagree. Uh, numbers mean everything. So for this year, internal motion monetary fund tracking two hundred billion dollar increase in China Russia uh, connections. Military to military, it's a nine day. Economically, uh, yes, also. So I tend to disagree with that assessment. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. No response. OK. It's time to stop, finally, I hope. <laughs> so next slide, please. Next slide, please. So uh, the final slide contains our contact information for any related questions. These are the links to Krelmo website right here, OK? Uh, the video, as I mentioned at the beginning, will be posted within about a week after today's event. The last YouTube link, okay, contains uh, all the videos. We'll get you directly to the playlist of all Krelmo videos, okay, with related information. So at this time, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank our panel for sharing their great expertise. Thank you very much. This concludes our session. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much. Hey, really nice to meet you. Good to meet you too. Thanks. 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 Thanks.